So I live in an apartment complex right next to a 7-Eleven, literally about a two minute walk from my door. So, since all this quarantine lockdown mess, I've been staying up later than usual, maybe around 2 or 3 a.m. most nights. So last night, a little bit after 12, I had a taste for some chips and decided I'd just go cross the street to 7-Eleven real quick, which I go to regularly. I make my way over, and on my way in, I had to pass this man who was browsing on the red box kiosk. I don't think much of it. I go inside, get some snacks, pay, and head out the door. As I'm coming out, though, the red box man is literally staring dead at me with these scarily bright light blue eyes. But not wanting to freak myself out even more, I say to myself, maybe he's zoned out or something and deep in thought. I wander into La La Land myself sometimes, so by thinking that, I was trying to make myself more comfortable having to walk past this strange man. I'm headed back into my apartment complex, which is on this side of the street. It has a creaky gate door. I realized as I was walking that I never heard it slam behind me, like I always have every time before. I look back, and the man is standing right behind me, not close up on me, but still definitely following. Once again, trying to ease my mind, I think to myself that he must be going home. I also noticed, though, that he didn't have any discs in his hand, for as much as he was at the kiosk the whole time I was in the store, taking my sweet, indecisive time. Not wanting to come off as scared, I kept my same pace. I probably should have sprinted, though, because fuck being nice. Anyways, I'm literally just a few steps away from my door, which is upstairs, when the man randomly calls out to me. Hey, do you have a lighter? Out of instinct, I turned my head to the fact I knew someone was speaking to me, and responded. No, I don't. Sorry. I didn't want to just go up my stairs, because I didn't want to let this man know exactly which apartment I live in. I was planning on walking around until I lost him, but he asked me another question. Hey, could I use your bathroom? No, sorry, my roommates probably wouldn't be comfortable with me letting someone in this late. I don't have any roommates, but I damn sure didn't want this man getting any ideas thinking I was by myself. I kept on walking, but the man was still following me. I simply ask him, do you live around here or something? I have a buddy that does, and he was supposed to meet me across the way there, but maybe he fell asleep. I've never been here before, but I do know his door is number 201. Could you help me find it? 201 is my door. If you have a friend that lives over here, why are you asking to use my bathroom? I knew this man was lying, and up to something. I quickly came up with, 201, that should be right past the pool next to the laundry area. My friends are waiting for me, so I should get going. My gut told me to head to my car, though, because what if he watched where I was going and decides to give me a surprise later on? No, I watch too many movies and read too many stories uploaded on here. I start heading towards the parking lot, not running, but definitely walking way quicker than before. I look back and realize that the man is chasing me at this point. I hurry up and pull my keys out of my pocket. I jump into my car and immediately lock the doors. The man runs up and starts pounding on my driver's side window. Open the door, you bitch! I can't help but focus on those creepy blue eyes, but I also notice that he was reaching for something in his pocket. I start up my car before I can see what it is he's going to pull out. I heard a loud pop, but I didn't give a fuck in that moment, as long as I could get the fuck out of his presence. I drove for about five minutes down the street to this Arco gas station before I finally called the police. Waiting on the police to arrive, I noticed what the popping sound was. This wacko had popped my back tire with a switchblade. Of course, when the police arrive and check the area, the motherfucker was long gone. They did question the 7-Eleven clerk, and he let them know that the man had been up there a few times since last week. He'd never been a problem before, but he was obviously homeless. I'm still shook up about what went on last night. I think I'm just going to chill on late night trips to the 7-Eleven for a while.
My name is Charlie. I used to smoke a lot of weed back in the day when I was a teenager, but it became very bland and boring, but I also told myself not to try any other drugs. At school, my friend Christine told me that she heard the best weed was on a dark web. I knew a little about the deep and dark web, but I thought that drugs would be something geared more toward the deep web. Maybe I didn't know as much as I thought. My friend got with me later and told me she ordered me some weed. About a week later, I was at home by myself on a Friday night when someone knocked at my door. I went to the door and looked out of the peephole and saw some guy with a black t-shirt, black Yankees cap, with sunglasses on, and it looks like a box in his hands. I was immediately skeptical because it was 9 p.m. He didn't need sunglasses at night, and no one delivered packages this late. I didn't say anything because I figured he would just walk away. I called Christine to ask her how long that order would take, and she said about a week. I told her that there's a man outside my door with a package. Could that be him? She asked, why would someone be standing outside your door with weed? Then all of a sudden, I heard, Hey, Charlie, I have your package. I know you're home. I see you through the window. I turned around, and this man was standing on a patio on my back porch looking through the sliding door windows. I'm guessing this guy went from my front door to my back porch because I wasn't answering the door. I told my friend and she said to call the cops. He was trying to get in the back messing with the door handle. I hung up on my friend and I called the cops. I ran out of sight of this guy and I didn't hear him anymore. About five to ten minutes later, the cops showed up. That box was outside my back door and written on it was, you're lucky. And there was nothing in the box but paper. After that, I never spoke with my friend Christina anymore because honestly, I didn't trust her. I thought she tried to set me up. Anytime someone brings up the dark web or even the deep web, I will either change the topic or I'll be quiet. I used to visit it occasionally, but after that situation, I've never done it again. My name is Kevin. This story took place seven years ago when I was 13. I had a sleepover at my friend Paul's house one night. This wasn't the first time we had a sleepover. What we would do is play video games until around 11 p.m. Then we would start trolling people on Facebook. And this night was no different. Paul and I spent the evening eating McDonald's, playing video games and watching scary movies up until around 10.30 p.m. when we logged into Facebook using a fake account we created and would send messages to people we knew. We came across one guy who lived in our area whose name was Frank. He was a black dude, buff, and had tattoos. For some reason, we thought it would be funny to prank call him as his phone number was listed in his bio. We had a ring twice before he picked up. He picked up with a firm, yeah. Paul made a joke about Frank and his appearance, and we both were laughing. Frank then started cursing and yelling, and we hung up the phone laughing our heads off. The rest of the night, we made more prank calls and commented childish things on people's accounts. I think it was around 1 a.m. or something. Me and Paul were getting tired while watching a movie and then we received a text from an unknown number. I asked who was that, and it said, that's so funny, with a picture attached to it. After examining the picture properly, we saw it was a street sign that wasn't far from Paul's house. We both looked at each other, scared and confused. What if they come to my house, Paul asked. I tried to calm him down and think rationally. He wasn't at his house, only nearby. Maybe he is only guessing where we are to freak us out a bit. We carried on watching the movie, hoping the phone wouldn't go off again. 
About 10 minutes later, however, we received another text without a picture this time, and it read, look outside. Me and Paul froze in fear. I remember being so afraid to even move. The lights were off, so you couldn't see us from outside. So I got the courage to take a sneaky look through the blinds. I couldn't see anyone, not even a car. After scanning the street properly, I said, Paul, there's no one out there. He checked as well. I told him it was probably just a text to scare us. He doesn't know where our house is exactly, like I said earlier. It didn't leave our minds, but we started to calm down a bit. Plus, we didn't receive a text message for a while now. And about an hour later, me and Paul went downstairs to make some noodles. As we were cooking, we get a phone call from an unknown number. Of course, it had to be that guy who had been texting us. I said, don't answer. The phone stopped ringing. Paul then texted the number saying, I'm sorry if we upset you, but it was just a prank. The next thing that happened was the scariest thing I've ever experienced. A phone lit up just outside the kitchen window from the backyard, and a very large man was standing there looking at us. It was Frank. He looked so angry and held up a large knife and made a huge scratch into the window to where our necks were. We jumped out of our skin, screamed, and ran upstairs to Paul's parents. We told them there was a man outside. They came down and checked the backyard and Frank was gone. We didn't tell the whole truth as we were afraid of getting in trouble. I don't think we slept the whole night. We still had sleepovers at Paul's house, but we never pranked or trolled anyone again. We also didn't hear anything from Frank, but we didn't need to. We got the message. I never even met him. I didn't know his name or face. I was blissfully unaware of his very existence. I will never know why or when it started. I'm glad for that, I guess. I moved into my very small apartment in February of last year. My landlord, Olivia, was a sweet older woman who would cook too much food and bring me leftovers. She was great to me even after I told her my problem. I'm antisocial, but she didn't mind renting to a reclusive young girl who reminded her of her daughter. Every few weeks, she would knock on my door and then leave, letting me know she was leaving something for me. I loved that. Not even my family would cook so well. The next morning, I wash and leave her empty containers outside my door and by an hour or so, she would come back and take them away. My other neighbours seemed fine, but I never really talked to them. I work from home, so any time I was ever forced to go out, I rushed out and into my apartment, avoiding an uncomfortable situation. I loved living alone. It was everything I hoped for. I could just breathe. By April, though, I started noticing things were not right. Things were moving, or plain disappearing. I was convinced it was just anxiety, caused by my new medication and the move. Another side effect was that it made me so drowsy. Since I hated seeing the doctor, I just dealt with it. I took naps during the day now, and eventually stopped caring. That is, until one incident doubled my paranoia. Olivia brought me some sort of Greek toss salad for lunch one day, and I enjoyed it with my friend, Netflix. I fell asleep in the middle of Portlandia, and I woke up that evening at 5pm per usual. What wasn't usual was that my bedding on the opposite side of me was disturbed. I only sleep on my right side, always. Even more, it felt warm. 
My first thought was that I must have rolled around a lot, but I knew it was too odd to dismiss. I got up and I searched my apartment, gripping my phone with 911 typed in. Nothing else was disturbed. Everything was exactly like it should be. I let it go. For the next two weeks, everything was normal. Pardon the occasional misplaced shoe or drawn back shower curtain. I thought about telling someone, my parents, maybe Olivia, but if it's not life or death, I'm not reaching out to anyone. I wasn't scared. I was nervous, perhaps a little stubborn as well, but I stayed. I'm not letting some stupid anxiety ruin my lovely, lonely world. May came, and it was getting worse. My underwear, toothbrush, hell, maybe even my food was being misplaced. Every time I woke up, there was some strange odour in the air. I finally realised this won't go away if I keep ignoring it. I called up my mum, and I begged to come and stay for a few days. When I got home, I told them everything. Saying it out loud solidified any creepy suspicions. That weekend, my dad went to my apartment, and what was found was true horror. Written all over the walls was, Come back, baby, please. He ran out and called the police. There was no one living in my apartment, but someone definitely had access besides me. The investigation revealed a man, Henry, the son of my landlord Olivia, was in a projected relationship with me. They showed me his confession on tape. He admitted coming into my apartment every night and every day with his mother's extra key. He claimed that we were in love and that he had my permission. He drugged his mother's food that she left out for me, which of course caused my drowsiness, and he would let himself in, watch me sleep, touch my hair, and kiss my shoulder. The leftovers in the fridge were tested, and confirmed that suspicion. I was absolutely horrified and disgusted. A man I never knew existed collected my hair, clothes, and trash, and practically lived in my apartment for four months. This happened two years ago. My name is James, and my girlfriend at the time was Susie. Susie and I got into an argument about a girl. She was just texting me about the edibles. The girl just wanted to know who had edibles and the prices on them. I remember I used the bathroom and after I came back to the living room, I saw Susie on my phone and she looked angry. She started asking questions about the girl. You know, regular questions, am I cheating on her? Is she pretty? The most disturbing one was, if she was right here right now, would I kiss her or my girlfriend? That was a PG version of what she really asked. I told her she texted me about edibles and besides that, the girl doesn't even like guys. But I don't think my girlfriend knew that. So we continued to argue for about 20 minutes. I started to say this is stupid and I remember looking at the clock and it was 11 p.m. Since she was staying over that night, I told her we should just stop fighting and try to get some sleep or watch a movie. We agreed and turned on a movie. We were watching Don't Be a Menace in South Central while drinking your juice in the hood. As we were watching the movie, I noticed she was on her phone typing fast and just really involved in her phone. Every time I leaned in a little closer to see what was going on, she would always move her phone away and just give me a cold shoulder. We continued watching the movie until I heard somebody at my door. I said, I wonder who that could be at this time. Again, I looked at the clock and now it was one in the morning. My mom was in her room sleep, but after she heard the doorbell, she woke up asking who that was. I told her I didn't know, but I was going to find out. So as I started going to the door, I heard whispering from my girlfriend, 
like she was on the phone or something. I didn't really pay attention to it, so I finally got to the door and I looked through the peephole. I was met with some tall dude wearing mostly all black. I talked to him through the door and I asked him, what do you want? He replies with, I'm just here to drop off a package. Sorry, I'm late. And I was thinking, who delivers a package at one in the morning? So I told him to leave and he could come back some other time to deliver the package. He said no in a deep commanding voice. Just in that moment, my ex-girlfriend Susie comes walking towards me with a grin on her face. She says to me, so you're really not gonna tell me who that girl was texting you? I explained that she wasn't anybody and I didn't know her like that. And this is the wrong time to be asking me a question like that when there is somebody at the door I didn't know. Till this day, what she said still gives me the chills just thinking about it. She said, the guy at the door, He's here to get rid of you. At first, I gave out a nervous laugh and said, that's not funny. She said, yeah, it is. Well, at least for me, it is. As this was going on, the guy at the door kept messing with the door handle, trying to get in. So I was leaning up against the door, preventing him to come in. As I looked behind me, Susie was gone. A few seconds later, she comes back with a knife and said, either he's going to get you or I will. I started flipping out and thinking, what am I going to do? I can't die right here. Just in that moment, I heard a commanding voice saying, back away from the door or we'll shoot. I thought to myself, what the fuck? So I swung open the door and there was the police. One of the police officers told Susie to drop the knife because when I took my eyes off of her and I opened the door, she was right behind me, like literally right behind me. But the officer saying that must have scared her and she dropped the knife immediately. Apparently, while all this was going on, my mom called the cops and explained the situation the best she could. She pretended to be asleep so she wouldn't cause attention to herself and could get help as fast as she could. The police arrested both of them and took them to the station. Apparently, the guy that was there was her cousin. And the whole time the movie was playing, she was texting him telling him to come over and quote unquote deal with me i'm just happy that i'm still here today my mom saved my life i don't even want to imagine what they would have done with me i'm a 28 year old male but when this happened i was about 23. i worked at a mom and pop's pizza shop in a place in northern california It's a small farm town and has a few suburbs near it. I kind of did everything since I knew the family. They trusted me with running things while they were gone. This night, though, I was working deliveries and got the weirdest one of my life. Everything seemed fine when I took the order. The lady ordered anchovies on her pizza, and I always think people who order that are weird as shit. She made a point to tell me the pizza had to be hot when it got there, or she wouldn't pay for it. So I get the pizza and throw it in the warmer, and drive to her house before any of my other deliveries. I'd like to tell you guys that her house was creepy and run down, but it looks like your average one-story new housing development home. I ring the doorbell and put on my fake-ass customer service smile. You all know what I'm talking about. And as soon as she opens the door, I knew this was going to be bad. The haggard old lady who looked like she was a smoker of 50 plus years looked me dead in the eyes and said, It had better be hot, or I'm not paying like I told you over the damn phone. I understand, ma'am. I made sure to stop by your place first, even though it was last on my list. Bring it in and set it on the table. She said this. And now, I don't normally go inside customers' homes because I read too many stories on no sleep and let's not meet. But at this point, I'm just wanting to kill her with kindness and see where this will go. So I say, No problem. I also brought cheese and ranch for you if you need it. As soon as I opened the bag, she grabbed the box, and her hand was on the bottom of it, just rubbing it. It's not hot enough. You fuckers do this every time, and I'm not paying for this shit. Not a single dime. One thing I have an issue with is my mouth. I don't know when to just shut up and try to understand where people are coming from. Look, lady, your house is a five-minute drive from our shop, 
and I stopped by your place first. There's no way your pizza is cold. If you refuse to pay, you're going to be 86th, and I'll notate it on your account. She immediately walked into her kitchen and came back out. She had an old pizza from a few weeks prior she had ordered from us, and threw it at me. Take your fucking pizza and get out of my house. You're the devil. She yelled that at me and kept calling me Satan and the devil. Again, my mouth has no filter and I can't control it. I try, but I fail every time. As I'm closing the bag and laughing about how much I hate my job, I tell her, All right, ma'am, you will not be able to order pizza from us again. I hope you have a good day, and God bless you and your house. She kept following me outside to my car, screaming about how I was the fucking devil. And there are families out there just watching this all go down. I get in my car and start driving. Once I'm back, I tell my manager what happened, and she told me that the lady had already called in and screamed to her about what had gone down. Her story was that I cussed her out and got her order wrong. My manager shut her down and said I'd never do anything like that. But here's the weird part. She whispered into the phone to my manager and repeated, Send him back. Send him back. Send him back. She called once a day for almost three months, just whispering this to whoever answered. She started driving by the restaurant and yelling, The devil works here. You're all going to hell. Now, I wasn't scared. I was just pissed and wanted to retaliate, because I can't tell you how many times she tried to follow me back to my apartment when I got off work. One night, I pulled over and got out just for her to stop her car on the road with her lights on, yelling, The devil is here. After this, I jumped back in my car and sped off. Luckily, after six months of dealing with this lady, I found out she was schizophrenic and bipolar and hadn't been on her meds. Her daughter put her in a care home, but when she was cleaning out her house, she saw that her mom had pictures of me all over her bedroom wall with the word, yep, you guessed it, devil, scrawled all over it. She found me and explained everything to me. And thankfully, that was the end of it all. There was a time my parents went on a trip to Europe. I was taking care of their house. I was home for the summer from school anyway, so it was fine. I had been there for a few weeks and it was pretty quiet. I just went to work, came home, had some time with my friend, enjoying the house to ourselves and whatnot. But one night, I was just laying there watching TV when I heard this really weird low whistling sound coming from the window that was behind the couch. It struck me as sort of odd and I just shrugged it off. But then it happened again. It totally sounded like it was a person standing up against the window whistling. I looked out the window and obviously there was no one there. So I figured I should go check it out. If it was something like the wind on a siding, I should probably fix it because that would get annoying. So I walked out into the backyard. The backyard in my parents' house is really, really pretty. It's sparse, but sort of forest that leads to a road on the other side. So I looked at the house and didn't see anything. But then I heard the sound again. It was coming from the woods in the back. I was pretty creeped out at this point. And of course, I couldn't see anything in the woods, so I hurried back through the door and I locked it behind me. I never really heard that sound again for the next few days, until one night, I was asleep in my room, and I could have sworn I was awakened by the whistling sound against my second floor window. I listened hard, and it was dead silent. So I decided I should go ahead and look out the window. I did that whole thing where I crept super slowly towards it and just sort of peeked through it. Outside my window, there was a man just standing there. I was really sleepy, so I can't know how much of this I'm misremembering. But he was just sitting there staring at me. I was completely frozen and slowly, the man pursed his lips and I could hear that whistle again. It was crystal clear. It made me feel like crying. I tore myself away from the window and I hid under my covers. The next night I insisted that my friend stay with me. He did. 
and of course nothing happened. He figured that I was just tired and delirious and maybe I was right. It gets kind of anticlimactic here, but I didn't hear it for another week or so. And when I did, it was just one small whistle just happening randomly, coming from a wall or something like that. It just happens every week or so, and it always freaks me out tremendously. To this day, I would never stay in that house alone anymore. My money situation hasn't been the best lately. With rent and bills to pay, it's been a struggle. In my attempt to make ends meet though, I met someone I wish I hadn't. A few nights ago, I saw an ad on Craigslist, looking for someone to help move a few large items and boxes up from the basement. The job offered 12 bucks an hour cash, and estimated to be around 5-7 to seven hours worth of work. That sounded great to me. And, best of all, it was within walking distance of my house. I emailed the poster of the ad, and everything seemed great at first. He was thankful that someone had answered so quickly, because he really needed to get things done. After a few emails, though, he hits me with something. I want you to know that I'm a gay man. How old are you, by the way? That's a weird message to send. His sexuality should be none of my business. If you call up a plumber to come to your house, you don't share that information with him. I'm a 28-year-old guy, though. I'm in good shape, and I never leave the house without a knife in my boot and a sidearm on my waist. I need the money, and this guy's 68. If he tries anything, I'm confident I can handle myself. Besides that, I like to think the best of people. I try and tell myself that maybe he's just a bit flamboyant and has had trouble in the past hiring people who turned out to be homophobic. The time comes and I get to his house. He comes off as a normal and pleasant dude right from the bat. He's polite and friendly and has a really cool house. It's your typical middle class New England home from the early 40s. Not something I'd want to live in because you're so closed off with smaller rooms but they have a nice charm. He's even furnished it with antiques from the time period. So, I'm put a little at ease with everything going so well at first. He takes me down into the basement, and it is a bit creepy. Let's be honest here, most basements are. Even more so when it belongs to a stranger. He shows me what needs to be done, and I start getting to work. Everything goes fine for the first hour or so. Then, I notice out of the corner of my eye, he's watching me from around the corner. I try and tell myself it's no big deal. He just wants to make sure I'm not stealing any of his stuff, and that I'm doing what I'm supposed to. After a few minutes, he goes away. About 30 minutes later, he comes strolling in wearing nothing but underwear and socks. Oh, sorry, he says. I was just about to take a shower, and I forgot to tell you a few things. Well, that wasn't really the case, as he just repeats something he told me earlier. He's 68, though. Can't expect him to remember everything, right? A little more time goes by, and he calls me from upstairs and tells me to come and take a break and have a glass of water. Sounds good to me. I get upstairs walk into the living room, and he's sitting on the couch, completely naked. I freeze a bit, and he says, Is this okay with you? I told him that I already informed him I was straight, and if this is what he was looking for, he hired the wrong person. He starts apologizing and puts his little buddy away, and begs me to please finish the job, saying that he didn't mean to make me feel uncomfortable. Again, I need the money, so I agree. I figure there's no way this guy could overpower me, and he has no idea I'm carrying. I get back to work, and everything's fine for another couple of hours. I go back upstairs once the job's done to let him know. He tells me no problem, and to have a seat while he goes and gets the money. 
I sit down and take out my phone to browse the internet while I wait. After a few minutes, I just know he's right next to me. It's something most people always manage to realize. I don't know the science behind it, if there is any. I didn't consciously see or hear anything, but maybe your brain picks up on little cues subconsciously. Either way, I turn behind me, and there he is, dick out, going to town on it. I admit I freeze a bit from the shock of it. He reaches out and puts his hand on my shoulder. Now this is probably what creeped me out the most. With his hand on my shoulder, he leans in a little towards me, smiles and says, Now, don't go and tell anyone what you've just seen, okay? This is just our little secret. Nobody needs to know about it, right? That's not a line that should come to your mind if a 28-year-old is your normal victim. That's the kind of thing you get used to saying after doing shit like this to fucking kids. At that point, I jumped up, told him to give me the money he owes me, and started towards the door. He hands me the money while still jerking off, and says again, Don't forget, it's our secret. A few hours pass, and I receive an email from him. Thank you for what you did for me today. I feel as though we bonded and connected on a very special level. This was a wonderful day I'll never forget. I have more work for you tomorrow. Maybe you'll learn to enjoy watching me share my private moments with you. I didn't respond. Being a single mom is hard. Very hard. I hate my job. I have a slew of late pickup charges from my son's daycare and my body has gone fat from years of fast food dinners and alcohol abuse. Every day is a struggle. My mind is a prison cell, and I lost the key to the door so long ago that I don't even care to look for it anymore. That is why when I won a trip to Disney World through my company's annual raffle, I nearly cry tears of joy. Nothing good ever happens to my son and I. The list of our misfortunes are as long as my arm, and this just provided us with the one thing that we thought we would never recover, hope. Hope not just for a fun week, but hope that maybe the perpetual muck that has overtaken our lives ever since my husband left us five years ago would finally start to dissipate. You can imagine my horror then when I lost my son during the final day of our trip. We were making our way over to Space Mountain when suddenly I had to use the restroom. I told my son to sit on a nearby bench while I did my business, and then disappeared into the first clean stall I could find. When I exited the restroom a few minutes later though, he was gone. Fear gripped me as I whirled my head around the scattered crowd, trying my best to locate him before he wandered out of sight. My efforts were futile though. I spent the next five hours scouring the park in a panicked frenzy. No matter how hard I looked though, I couldn't find him. Just as I was about to call the police, I found him sitting on the bench that I had left him on earlier that day. He was wearing a full body Mickey Mouse costume, and I would have walked right past him if I hadn't recognized the worn out Scooby Doo backpack resting on his knees. I ran over to him and wrapped my arms around his head. His body was limp in my arms. If it wasn't for the steady rise and fall of his chest against my thigh, I would have thought he was unconscious. Where have you been? I swear I looked all over Magic Kingdom for you. And where did you get that Mickey Mouse costume? He didn't answer. It was at this point that I became concerned. My son is normally very talkative. It was unlike him to be so reserved, especially after such a traumatic event. Why don't you take off that mask? I want to see that you are okay. I reached down to pull off his mask but he swatted my hands away with such force I staggered back a step. Never before had he hit me. The blow surprised me so much that I stood there, motionless on the sidewalk, for almost a minute, unsure of how to respond. Eventually though, I regained my wits and sat down on the bench next to him. I know you are scared, I said, but everything is alright now. We're together again. You're safe. Once again, no answer. 
Why aren't you talking to me? Are you hurt? No answer. I tried for several more minutes to get him to respond, but I might as well have been talking to a mannequin. All he would do was sit there unmoving on the bench, staring off into the distance through his mouse eyes. The only time he would move was to swat my hands away every time I tried to remove his mask. We sat on the bench for over an hour before I grabbed his hand and led him back to our hotel room. Luckily, he didn't resist as I maneuvered him through a crowd. To my surprise, he followed me with dog-like docility and even allowed me to tuck him into bed that night, Mickey Mouse costume and all. I debated that night whether to contact the park authorities about his disappearance and stolen suit, but decided against it. My gut was telling me that I should, but I was just too exhausted to prolong the matter. He seemed relatively unharmed for one thing, and we had to get to the airport by 6 the next morning. Calling the authorities would potentially extend our stay, and I couldn't afford to buy another pair of plane tickets. So, I kept the matter to myself, and drifted off into a light sleep the moment my head hit the pillow. We arrived home around sunset the next afternoon. My son still wasn't talking, and continued to swat my hands away every time I tried to remove his costume. At this point, my concern skyrocketed. Not only was his behavior so bizarre, but he hadn't eaten or drank anything in over a day. Unless he was sneaking food and water while I wasn't looking, he had to be on the drink of dehydration. I decided to take him to the doctor early that next morning. Something terrible had obviously happened to him while he was missing, and I felt like a failure of mother for waiting so long to get him help. When we arrived at the doctor's office, he threw such a fit that the nurses had to restrain him. No matter how hard they tried to remove his mask though, he always found a way to counter their efforts. It was as if that thing was plastered onto his head. Eventually, the doctor became so concerned that he decided to do an x-ray. He told me that it was the quickest way to assess his health through the costume, and that they would devise a plan while the x-ray process to remove his mask. I thanked him for his help and then watched as they escorted my son into another room. The doctor returned a few minutes later. His face was so pale, I feared that he might pass out. We finished the x-ray, he said, voice shaky. Thank goodness, I said. Is he alright? The doctor stared at me for almost a minute without responding, hands shaking. Is something wrong? His head and spinal cord are the only parts of him underneath the costume. The rest of his body is missing. I'm 22 now, but this happened when I was 16. At the time, I lived in Staten Island, New York. For a little background, I'm a female, and at the time, I was 120 pounds soaking wet, with a height of 5'6". I thought I was invincible. I never imagined anything like this would have ever happened to me. It was March 17th of 2013, around 10.30 p.m., I was leaving my boyfriend's house. He walked me to the local bus stop as he always did. We joked and laughed while we waited for my bus to show up. Because it was kind of late, there weren't many cars on the street. I happened to notice a black SUV parked across the road. I didn't think much of it at the time. My bus eventually showed up and I said goodbye to my boyfriend and I boarded. I took a seat next to the bus driver. The rest of the bus was completely empty. The driver turned to me once we hit the first red light, and then he asked, What are you doing out this late? It was random and a bit creepy. I replied with, I was just hanging out with my boyfriend. We made small talk, and my initial apprehension was put at ease. The driver then told me that it wasn't exactly safe to be out and about at this hour, and that I should be more careful. I nodded, but as I said before, I was an arrogant 16-year-old who thought she was invincible. As my stop approached, I looked at my phone. The time read 11.30 p.m. My phone's battery was down to 5%. Oh, that's great, I thought to myself as I exited the bus and said my goodbyes to the driver. He told me to stay safe, and I gave him another nod 
as the door folded back shut. For some reason, I just stood there and watched the bus make its way down the street until its taillights were well out of sight. As I stood there at the empty stop, a sensation of what I can only describe as impending doom came over me. I made my way to the bench to sit down. The bus that dropped me off near my house was scheduled to arrive at 11.40. Only 10 minutes. As I sat there staring off into space, thinking about some things I had to do when I got home, a black SUV pulls up to the bus stop. The uneasy feeling I had earlier intensified. But I did my best to play it cool. The man rolls down his window and asks me, Hey, excuse me, do you know what time the bus is supposed to be here? He appeared to be a mix between Spanish and Asian, and had a medium build. At this point, I did not make the connection that this may have been the same vehicle I saw just before I boarded the first bus. I figured that he was probably just waiting for somebody. So I replied, It shouldn't be long. He then asked me how long I had been waiting. It was then that I started to get a little freaked out. This guy was giving me the creeps. But I considered that I might be just overreacting. Perhaps he was just trying to pass the time. But still, I kept my guard up. I answered that I hadn't been waiting long. He then proceeded to try to make more small talk. I was trying to be polite. But I also kept looking at my pitch black phone screen, trying to subtly hint to him that I wasn't interested in conversation. It was dark out by this point. The only luminescence was coming from some distant street lights. However, there were also two big trees outside the bus stop that were positioned in such a way that they blocked out most of the light. So if this guy tried anything, the dark would have provided decent cover. I nervously clenched my phone, the uncomfortable feeling inside increasing with every passing second. He then told me that he was new to the area and didn't know his way around too well. He claimed that he was in the army and was stationed nearby. He then asked me where the beach was. It's just down the street. I told him in a very matter-of-fact way, as if to convey, maybe you should go there so I don't have to look at you anymore. It was then that our eyes met. I could see his face very clearly. His eyes were not like any normal human's eyes. It was as if they were looking right through me, staring at me like a hungry fox who just discovered a trapped, defenseless rabbit. He then asked me, Do you mind if you show me around? Come on, get in the car for a little while. I may have been a naive 16-year-old, but I was not an idiot. I knew that if I got in that car, that would be the last time anyone ever heard from me. I was trying my best to show him that I wasn't afraid, so I politely declined while looking down the street for my bus. He then began to beg and plead. It was really kind of pathetic. I told him no once again. He then said something that I will never forget. Come on, baby. It won't take long. I promise. At that moment, my blood ran cold, and my stomach felt like it was going to drop right out of my ass. I felt absolutely sick, like I was going to throw up. But I kept my cool, and thankfully my bus was now in sight, and coming down the street. A feeling of relief washed over me. I told him no once again, thinking that would be the end of it. He then told me that he would drive me home right afterward. This guy would not give up, and I finally had enough. With all the strength and courage in me, I shouted, No, leave me the hell alone, you fucking loser! As my bus pulled up, I heard him say something genuinely terrifying. And I quote, Fine, bitch, I'll just follow you and see where you live. My heart started to race. My hands broke out in a cold sweat, and my body began to tremble with fear. I quickly got on the bus, and honestly, I don't know why I didn't tell the bus driver. I think I was just in a state of shock and was hoping that Mr. Jailbait Hunter in the SUV didn't mean what he said and that he was just pissed off and trying to scare me. When I sat down and looked out of the window, I saw the headlights of the SUV. They were tailing the bus. I thought I was going to have a mental breakdown. When the bus arrived at my stop, I ran like hell. I reached the front door of my house 
which was usually unlocked, but tonight, of all nights, it was locked from top to bottom. I frantically rang the doorbell while going through my bag to find my keys. I then heard someone pull up out front. Without turning around, I knew who it was. Just like in the movies, I dropped the keys as I was trying to put them in the front door. I finally managed to unlock my front door. Before turning the handle, I heard a car door slam shut from behind me. I quickly ran inside and slammed the door shut. In a panic, I explained to my mother and my older brother what happened. My brother ran outside and looked up and down the street. I was shaking, absolutely consumed by terror. My emotions finally got the best of me, and I could no longer hold back my tears. We called the police, and they came and searched the area. They asked me if I had gotten a tag number, and unfortunately, I had to tell the officers that it was too dark to see. But I did notice a sticker of some sort of bird on the back seat driver's side window. It didn't dawn on me until they left that this had been the same SUV that was across the street when I was with my boyfriend an hour prior. They told me that they checked the army base nearby and the surrounding area, but nobody had seen any vehicle matching the description I gave. All I could think about was what the bus driver had said to me and the irony of what took place that same night. Years went by and I didn't think much about this incident after that night. One day, I was scrolling through Facebook when I came across a picture my friend had posted. It was a story of a man who had been following her home from work for the past three days, and it was the same guy who I encountered five years prior. My heart felt like it was going to leap out of my throat. Looking at the post, I noticed that several other women had come forward, and they all shared similar experiences to mine. I ended up finding out that he almost kidnapped a 13-year-old girl. She allowed herself to be lured into his car, but once inside, she noticed a roll of duct tape, some rope, a pair of gloves, and a bottle of what turned out to be chloroform on the floorboard. She ended up jumping out of the window while they were stopped at a red light. I don't know all the details, but apparently he got physical with another woman, who was pregnant and tried to force her into his car. He got pretty ballsy and started trying to abduct women in broad daylight. The news found out that his name was Leo, and it was also discovered that he had a wife and two daughters, who were around three and five. They interviewed his neighbors, and to my surprise, they defended him, saying that all these women were just lying. It's truly unbelievable how stupid people are. Five separate accounts from five different women who have no connection with each other have come forward and shared their experiences. Could you please dislodge your head from your ass and face up to the facts? Anyway, to this day, I have no idea whatever became of him. The last I heard, he was still at large. I hope they caught him, so no other young women have to be subjected to this monster ever again. This happened on June 7, 2013, when I was a freshman in college. It was a regular day where I had three classes. I finished one class and had an hour between one class and the beginning of another. I always went to our campus library. But on my way to the library, I received a call from my brother. He told me that he saw a man shooting at a bus in the middle of the street. I expressed to him how crazy I thought that was. He also told me that the car sped away. He doesn't know where they went. I got to the library and I told him that I would call him back. As I was sitting in the library with my head in a book, I happened to see a random car park in the middle of our campus and two people got out. One man and one woman. The woman was running frantically and the man got out wearing all black with what looks like a rifle in his hand. I then thought back to what my brother just told me, thinking that this might be the same person. At the same time, I thought to myself, why is this police officer getting out of that random car? He was dressed just like a SWAT officer, sort of. I sat there trying to figure out what was going on as this man walked across the courtyard. Then all of a sudden, he walked up to this woman, who I knew from one of my classes, and without hesitation, 
He shot her and continued to walk toward our building. I began to yell out to everyone that he has a gun, and I was pointing outside. I saw a few people react when I did, due to the sound of the gunshot. They began to yell also. It all happened so fast and a lot of us began to hide because we couldn't get out. Some people got out, but we didn't have time to. I hid in an aisle. I saw the man enter through the automatic doors with his rifle to his side. He was yelling out that he was a police officer, but he didn't hold his weapon like one. But once he said that a few students came out from hiding, he grabbed his weapon and they ran, but he didn't shoot. I peeked my head out more as the man walked to the front desk. I can see the librarian peek her head around, but she looked confused. The man saw her as he were walking past the desk. He stopped. And he looked to where she was, but she just so happened to move away. She actually walked away instead of run for some reason. He walked through the doors into a hallway where she went into. I came out from hiding and placed myself where I could see the hallway all the way down the hallway. He followed the librarian. She went into a closet with other people and the shooter started to bang on the door, but he kept saying that he was the police. He told them to open within a few minutes or he'll shoot, but within a few seconds, he began to fire into the door. I heard people screaming and I wanted to help, but I felt that would be suicide for me being that I didn't have a weapon. I heard people saying that the police are coming. The man stopped shooting and started to bang on the door even more. He then left that door, heading back toward us. I went back into hiding, but could still see. He walked through the room where we were and he went out into the first set of doors and the cops were right there. The cops and the shooter began to fire at the same time and then it all stopped. The cops dragged the man outside and escorted all of us outside. Out there, it was pretty chaotic. Eventually we found out who the shooter was. His name was John Sawari. He went on a shooting spree within our city that day. This happened in 2013 but it still feels like it just happened yesterday. This happened on the day after Christmas in the year 2000. I worked at Edgewater Technology in Wakefield, Massachusetts. The day started off pretty normal. I clocked in and went to my station. We all did. I can remember that the aura of the day was off, but I might just be saying that due to what happened that day. After working for a little bit, I had to run to the bathroom due to my Christmas food from the day before. TMI, I know. I was renting a magazine, using a restroom, and out of nowhere. I heard people yelling and running and saying that he has a gun. Then I heard the rounds go off. It scared the crap out of me, literally. I got up without wiping. Then I heard more shots, but they were closer than before. A few people burst through the bathroom door and they were saying that he's right there. They closed the door and they put the trash can in front of the door while pushing against it. They were also saying that Mike has gone crazy. We heard someone stop right by the door, but he was pleading and then we heard another shot, but he was still making noises, then another shot and then we didn't hear him anymore. And then it got silent. He was right in front of our door. We heard a gun get cocked and someone touching the door handle, but he stopped. There was no more shooting, but we could hear screaming and the fire alarm going off. Everyone in the bathroom was crying and it got worse when the blood was coming in the bathroom from under the door from the person that was laying there. About a minute later, we heard police in the hallway and they were in front of our door, but we were still afraid until we heard them assess the person that was bleeding by our door. They said he was gone. They opened the door and told us it's okay. They got him. The shooter was waiting for the cops in our reception area. His name was Michael Morgan McDermott. He actually worked with us. I don't know why he did what he did, but I can say that it was the worst day of my life. But what I won't forget is the scene once we left the bathroom. So many people were hurt, and the looks on the faces of those who got in his way would never leave my memory. What really confuses me is that I saw Michael right before this happened, and he was joking around with everyone. This situation really made me not be so quick to trust individuals. 
no matter how long I've known them. This is the worst day of my life. I was eight years old in the third grade, and my younger brother Lucas was in kindergarten. Our school had three different lunch times, kindergarten and first grade, first period, second and third grade, second period, and fourth and fifth grade, third period of lunch. Once the first period of lunch was over, I remember we were doing a weekly assignment. Usually those take about 20 to 40 minutes to finish. 40 minutes later, right as I had finished it, I remember the dean's voice played on the speaker. He sounded scared and panicked as he said, all students and staff, this is not a drill, go into lockdown. I felt worried and started to panic myself, as my somewhat cool and laid back teacher seemed to panic as well and rushed to the door to lock it, close the blinds, and whispered to hide in the blind spot away from the windows. As we all sat in silence for what seemed like hours, we heard a knock on the door. A few girls and boys, including me, all jumped a bit. The slight knocking soon turned into loud banging. A few girls started to panic to only make the already scary situation worse. Minutes felt like hours for him to finally leave. After 15 minutes of hiding in pure terror, the dean finally came over the PA system telling us to walk in the single file line to the entrance of the school to be greeted by police. By the time me and my brother Lucas went into our mom's car, I looked to my brother. He was pale and looked around frantically. When we got home, I asked what was wrong and he said something that still scares me to this day. When that guy was pounding on my brother's classroom door, my brother peeked out from the sink. He saw a tall man looking through the window. He said his teacher literally pushed his head down frantically to hide him so he wouldn't be seen. He mentioned that the door had a window and it was barely covered. I also want to say that this was 2013, so I vaguely remember most of the details and had to ask my friend if he remembered the whole incident. I want to show you the layout of the school. The yellow line is where my class is. The red is where my brother's class was. Now we came to the conclusion that he either entered into the, where the orange line is or the blue line. To give you context on where those lines are located, the orange line leads to the back entrance where there is a fence that is easily able to climb over. The blue line shows a way back between the school grounds and some houses. There's a tiny gate, which is also easy to hop over. Now I want to clarify that those were assumptions on how he could have entered the school. If he went through the orange line, he must have went to my classroom, then hit a few more classrooms, then went to the kindergarten area, which is where my brother's class was. Or he did vice versa, if he were to enter where the blue line was. Since this was back in 2013, we don't remember if this guy was caught or not. But all I hope is, is that he was caught. My name is Shelly and 10 years ago, I wanted to make my own money because I was tired of asking my parents for money. I put in a lot of applications and I ended up getting hired at Chick-fil-A. I'm not going to lie, I was definitely excited because of all of the chicken nuggets I was going to be eating. Anyways, after I got hired, I started to get the hang of the job. It was pretty easy. I worked outside in the drive through line a lot because we were the busiest fast food restaurant in our town and people really liked my personality. After working there for a few months, my dad's creepy friend Tyler would come there every day at the same time and go to the same drive through line, which was weird because I worked there after school and there were two drive through lines. The drive through line he'd always go to was mine and he would always call me Shell Shell, which I've hated since I was a small kid. The thing is, he'd always order small stuff like a small fry or small cookies and cream milkshake. A few times he came into the line, pull up to me, and then he'd say that he forgot his debit card and he would just try and talk to me. I'm not dumb. I knew exactly what he was doing. Ever since I turned 13, he always acted weird toward me, telling me that I'm growing up into a woman, or that I look like a young woman now. There was this time when my parents were having a get together with family and friends, and I yelled out to my parents that I had to pee, and I ran upstairs. I swear a few seconds later, Tyler burst through the door, looked at me and said, wow, 
and stared at me. Then he straightened up real quick and said, sorry, my bad, and closed the door. Like I said, he was weird. So we closed at 10 p.m., but we always take orders up until around 9.59. One day, we were inside cleaning up, and it was around 10.30 p.m. There were about five or six of us in Chick-fil-A at the time. I was mopping the floor, and a few of us saw a car pull up to the drive through but turned around at the entrance because we put cones out there after 10 p.m. The car drove around our parking lot at least 10 minutes, and I noticed that it had temporary tags on it. After a while, our manager went outside and went up to the car due to it stopping in front of one of our windows every time it drove around. I watched the manager walk to the car as the driver rolled down the window. The window was all the way down before my manager reached the car. And to my surprise, it was Tyler, my dad's friend. He had a new car that I didn't recognize. But what made this very weird was that even when he rolled the window down, he never looked at my manager. He was staring directly at me talking with my manager. I was standing behind the entrance door. He saw me looking at him, looking at me, but he never turned away like a normal person would. My manager walked back in and told me and my coworkers to hurry up so we can get out of here. I was the last person to get done with my closing, so it was just me and my manager. My manager told me to make sure the doors are locked. I told him okay, then I went to the bathroom. I figured I'll lock them once I'm done. As usual, I was on my phone while using the bathroom, and the bathroom door opens. I thought it was weird because my manager is the only other person in the building, and he's a guy. I yelled out that he's an idiot and he's in the wrong bathroom, but the thing is, he never left. It got weirder because I can hear him breathing by the door, but then I heard, Shell, shell. It's me, Tyler Poop. Are you in here? I picked up my feet so he couldn't see them, but then he started to push open every stall door, saying my name. I texted my boss and it literally said, help, bathroom. Then Tyler got to my stall. He attempted to push the door open and then he laughed. He said that he knows that I'm in there. He looked in the crack of the door and said, there you are. He then got down on his hands and knees, reached his hand under the door and attempted to unlock the stall. I kicked his arm and he said, it's me, Uncle Tyler. As he said that, he proceeded to crawl under my stall door. I started to climb above my stall. Then my manager burst through the door as I was screaming and crying. Tyler and my manager began to fight. I called the cops. After a few seconds, Tyler was unconscious on the bathroom floor. When the cops and the EMS got there, he was cuffed and loaded up into the ambulance. He was hit with a few charges and was recently released from jail. That situation just heightened my awareness of my surroundings. Back when I was living on the streets, well technically in my car, I would always post up by fast food restaurants because people would always give me their change or some of the food that they had recently purchased. One day I posted at the entrance of a plaza and in that plaza the busiest place was a Chick-fil-A. Throughout the day I received a few bucks and a lot of chicken nuggets. After being out there for a few hours I noticed a car that left a few times and came back to park in the Chick-fil-A parking lot with covered license plates but the person never got out of the car. Of course, I thought it was weird, but I didn't think anything of it. Throughout the day, I'd take my food to my car and I'd eat. Around 8 p.m., most of the plaza was closing up and the traffic started to slow down. Finally, when Chick-fil-A slowed down for a few minutes, a man in the car got out and he walked up to the door of the restaurant and took a picture of the inside. A few seconds later, what looked like the manager came outside and it looked like she was arguing with the guy. She went back inside and the man got back in his car, got on his phone, and left about five minutes later. FYI, I was parked about 25 feet away from the Chick-fil-A parking lot. and could see everything that was going on. So a few hours go by and the place was closed. From the outside, it looked as if the employees were cleaning up. I was trying to fall asleep, then I saw that car from earlier pull up. 
Then it woke me all the way up. There were two cars left in the parking lot. His car and some other car. And some people left. The only person I saw inside was the woman that he was talking to earlier. I saw the man get out of his car at this point. He was wearing dark colors and with gloves on. And I saw the lights get turned off inside of Chick-fil-A. The man was standing on the side of the building by a dumpster, but in a way where he can't be seen. He was in the shadows. At that point, I leaned my seat all the way back so no one could see me. The woman walked out, turned around, and began to lock the door. As soon as she turned around, that man sprinted toward her, yanked her hair, and started to yell at her as he took her back inside. I leaned up a little bit to get a better look, but I couldn't see anything. There was nothing for about 10 minutes until the man walked back outside. He went straight to his car, but instead of driving away, he drove up to the door and went back in with his trunk left open. A few minutes later, I saw something that I would never forget. The man was dragging the woman's body, but there was no head. He struggled to get her in the trunk, but eventually he got her there. He went back in there and came out with a Chick-fil-A bag full of something and threw it in his trunk. He went back inside again for what seemed like 20 minutes. He came back out, locked up Chick-fil-A, and drove away. Someone else came back for the other car in the parking lot. A few days later, I went into a Starbucks to use the restroom, and on the news was a story about a missing woman. They showed the picture, and it was the woman who worked at Chick-fil-A. They were interviewing her husband, who was crying during the whole interview. What creeped me out is that her husband was the man that I saw with her that fateful night. I know he killed her, but he was on the news as if he didn't have anything to do with it, and like he doesn't know. Seeing that lady that night has haunted me since. It was Halloween of 2012, and I was closing at work, which is Chick-fil-A. We were a new establishment in the area that we're in, and the neighborhood was pretty bad. In and out all afternoon and evening, I saw hundreds of people dressed in their costumes. All of the cliche costumes, Jason, Freddy Krueger, and Michael Myers. At around 7.30, there was a long line inside, and out of nowhere, there was some commotion. My manager came out to break it up. When he broke it up, some guy in the ghost face costume from Scream ran out of the door. That person that ran out of the door got into it with a woman that was dressed as Meg. Meg from Family Guy. At least that's what I thought she was until she told us that she wasn't in costume. She was just ugly. Anyway, this woman told our manager and the cops that some person in the ghost face costume tried to lure her seven-year-old daughter out of the building to his car. The little girl was running back and forth between her mother, who was in line in the play area inside. I guess the man in the scream costume told the girl that her mom told her to wait in his car and he grabbed her. The mom turned around and saw it. Then she started to yell and scream. A few hours later, we locked the doors and then some guy knocked at our drive through window. He had on a ghost face costume from the movie Scream, but I don't know if it was the same guy from earlier. I yelled out that we're closed and this guy tries to bust through the drive through window. I screamed and the manager ran out. And then that man ran to our front door banging. Then he stopped and just stared at us. At that point, it was just my manager and I. My manager called the cops and the man left and popped his trunk of his car. He grabbed something out of his trunk and put it under his costume. He then walked back up to the front door. He stared for another 30 seconds and pulled out a gun from under his costume, aimed it and pulled the trigger. We both ducked and screamed, but nothing happened. We looked up and he was fumbling with his gun. He was loading, unloading, and reloading. It had jammed. Then the cops showed up with their guns drawn. He got on the ground and they arrested this guy. We found out that this was a dangerous guy and he had a huge rap sheet. And we were pretty lucky that nothing happened to us that night. It may be cowardly, but I quit that job soon after that happened because of the neighborhood that, that Chick-fil-A was in. I'm originally from Mexico. For reasons that will become very obvious, I wish to remain anonymous. 
I used to be involved in the Mexican cartel. I mainly transported drugs across the border into the United States. To make a long story short, I was caught and cooperated with the feds in exchange for immunity and asylum. Before I go any further, you can go ahead and label me a snitch if you want to. I don't care. I personally feel pretty good about writing out a bunch of drug-dealing murderers that work for an organization that is responsible for destroying so many of my fellow Mexicans' lives. I was forced into this life at a young age. I've always hated the cartel and was already plotting a way to flee Mexico with my mother and two younger sisters. You could say that it was a good thing that I ended up getting caught. The story is not about how I got out of the cartel. It's about the closest call I ever had during my time with the cartel. This happened during the early days. It was the summer of 2005. I remember the date specifically because I had just turned 18 a day prior. Even though I was barely an adult, I was a very intimidating looking guy. I come from a long line of very physically strong men. I've been lifting weights since I was a child. I'm an even-tempered guy, and I don't consider myself to be an aggressive person. But I will put somebody through the wall if they piss me off. It was because of my physical presence and my piece-of-shit father, who was also in the cartel made me a target for recruitment. When I first started out, myself and two other guys would drive around Mexico City and collect debts and packages from people who owed money to the cartel or one of our distributors. It was on the fourth or fifth run that we ran into some trouble. There was this particular club we frequented where a lot of business was conducted. To make things simple, an exchange would go down in a back room and we would come shortly after and collect the revenue and drop it off to our capo. So that night, we entered the club and began making our way to the back room. It was a fairly busy night for the club. This DJ from out of town was performing there, so people from all over were there to see him. To get to the back room, we had to go through the main dance floor to the opposite side of the building. There were some renovations that prevented us from using the back entrance. We got out onto the dance floor and started making our way through the crowd. When we were about halfway there, I saw something out of the corner of my eye. It was the barrel of a shotgun being pointed directly at me. I quickly ducked, and not a second later, I heard the gun go off. Unfortunately, an innocent girl who was standing beside me caught the bullet. She was shot at point-blank range. And I don't mean to be insensitive when I say this, but the poor girl's head was blasted apart. I remember several things happening simultaneously after the shotgun went off. All of the partygoers immediately fled the club. From my position on the ground, all I saw was a wave of moving legs. When I stood up, I saw a deserted club, my two co-workers with their guns drawn, cursing up a storm. And, unfortunately the corpse of the young girl who was just shot. I assume that the shooter got away in the chaos. We quickly busted into the back office to find another bullet ridding corpse. It was a club owner, who was our contact. We immediately fled the scene before the police showed up. I was never informed as to what happened with the club owner, and who almost took my head off with a shotgun. I was on the lowest rank of the cartel, and they kept us in the dark about a lot of things. I'm grateful that I'm no longer a part of that life. I would like to end things by saying a big fuck you to that asshole who tried to kill me and ended up shooting an innocent girl that night. And to all of those cartel members who got locked up because of me. You got what you deserved. And I'll see you in hell. I'm a 20 year old male, and this happened to me in the winter of 2018, the day after Christmas. Me and my parents were on vacation in Maine, visiting my grandmother. As you can probably imagine, being in the state of Maine during the winter, it was freezing. We came up from Texas, so this was definitely not my climate if you know what I mean. My parents had gone out to visit a friend who lived in the area while me and my grandmother stayed back and watched some movies. My grandmother turned in at about 8 o'clock, and I eventually got bored of watching TV, so I decided to put on my coat and go for a walk outside. 
My grandmother's neighborhood has this neat stone maze, complete with angel statues and fountains. It was really cool, and something you really don't see a whole lot in neighborhoods these days. My grandmother's neighborhood was one of those 50 plus communities. I doubt you could have something like this in a neighborhood full of kids without it getting defaced with spray painted pictures of penises or something. For me, I actually admired works of architecture like this and was impressed by the amount of effort it must have taken to construct it. It was open from dusk till dawn, however, my grandmother told me that there was no neighborhood security during the holidays and no one would say anything if I wanted to go through the maze after hours, so I did just that. I brought a flashlight with me of course, and it took me about 5 minutes to reach the entrance of the maze from my grandmother's place. The maze wasn't massive, but it was big enough that you could get turned around, at least for a little bit. If I could give you guys a somewhat accurate visual of this maze, think of the maze in Resident Evil 4, where Leon had to fight off those dogs and gather puzzle pieces. That's roughly the same size as this maze. When I walk through this maze during the daytime, I would usually listen to my headphones, but something told me not to put them on that night, and it's a good thing that I followed my instincts. After I'd say it was about 10 minutes, I suddenly heard the sound of metal scraping against the stone walls. As soon as I heard the sound, alarm bells went off in my head. I froze in place and carefully listened for any other sounds. The scraping noise came again, except this time, there was a deep voice that followed it. Abandon hope all ye who enter here. This sent chills down my spine, realizing that I was now in a maze, at night, with a possible maniac. The maze had these areas where a statue or a fountain would be. In these locations, there was shrubbery that lined the maze walls. There was just enough space between the wall and the bushes for a small person like me to hide behind. And since I didn't know the best route to exit the maze from where I was, I decided that the best course of action was to hide. I made my way into the area where a statue of David the Archangel was, and I quickly took cover behind the shrubbery that lined the walls. The streetlights located outside of the maze provided enough light for you to see your surroundings. However, it was still dark enough to obscure the details of objects and people. I feel that I needed to point that out, because from my hiding spot, I could see the corridor that I entered from. After about a minute, I watched a dark figure emerge from the shadows and make its way in front of the statue. I remember thinking how awesome it would be if the statue came to life and helped me out of this situation. But that thought quickly faded when the figure made its way directly in front of me. I could now see that it was holding something in its hands. I know that I said that you really couldn't tell any distinguishing features of objects because of the poor lighting. However, it was obvious what the figure was holding, even in the dark. I could make out the distinct shape of a pickaxe. As the figure moved slowly through the area, I heard what I can only describe as teeth clattering. This only disturbed me even more as the dark shadow moved to the other side of the area and disappeared into the opposite corridor. After a few minutes of gathering my wits, I was reasonably sure that if I went back down the way I came, I could backtrack and make my escape. I cautiously moved out from my hiding spot to the corridor. I stopped in my tracks as I heard the sound of metal scraping again. It was coming from the opposite corridor where the figure had vanished. Before I could turn to look, I heard that same deep voice cut through the silence. I see you. I turned my head to see the figure running towards me, pickaxe raised above its head. That's when I took off through the corridor and frantically made my way through the dark maze. There was no time to navigate through the maze properly, so I just had to guess my way through the labyrinth as the lunatic with the pickaxe closed in behind me. After about five minutes of twists and turns, I finally saw the exit. I tore through the snow-covered ground and towards the opening. Just before I crossed the threshold, I heard a loud smash coming from right behind me. 
I gave a quick glance to see the pickaxe lying in the snow by the entrance. What I think happened was that my pursuer saw that I was about to exit the maze and decided to heave his pickaxe at me, but missed. As soon as I was outside of my grandmother's house, I pulled out my phone and called the police. But like with most stories like this, they arrived too late. Having experienced this myself, I can tell you that this outcome does make sense. My assailant failed to capture or kill me, so I don't think that they would stick around for the police to show up. The officers took my statement and did a thorough search of the area. They also had a squad car patrolling through the neighborhood for the rest of that night. I didn't tell my parents or my grandmother what happened until the next day. I figured that there was no need to worry them that night. I consider myself to be a pretty level-headed person, and that's mainly why I chose to share my story. Situations like this are terrifying, but you have to try to keep your wits about you. If I had lost my composure in that maze, I'm pretty sure that pickaxe would have found its way into my skull. Being a single mom is hard. Very hard. I hate my job. I have a slew of late pickup charges from my son's daycare, and my body has gone fat from years of fast food dinners and alcohol abuse. Every day is a struggle. My mind is a prison cell, and I lost the key to the door so long ago that I don't even care to look for it anymore. That is why when I won a trip to Disney World through my company's annual raffle, I nearly cried tears of joy. Nothing good ever happens to my son and I. The list of our misfortunes are as long as my arm, and this should provided us with the one thing that we thought we would never recover, hope. Hope not just for a fun week, but hope that maybe the perpetual muck that has overtaken our lives ever since my husband left us five years ago would finally start to dissipate. You can imagine my horror then when I lost my son during the final day of our trip. We were making our way over to Space Mountain when suddenly I had to use the restroom. I told my son to sit on a nearby bench while I did my business and then disappeared into the first clean stall I could find. When I exited the restroom a few minutes later though, he was gone. Fear gripped me as I whirled my head around the scattered crowd, trying my best to locate him before he wandered out of sight. My efforts were futile though. I spent the next five hours scouring the park in a panicked frenzy. No matter how hard I looked though, I couldn't find him. Just as I was about to call the police, I found him sitting on the bench that I had left him on earlier that day. He was wearing a full body Mickey Mouse costume, and I would have walked right past him if I hadn't recognized the worn out Scooby Doo backpack resting on his knees. I ran over to him and wrapped my arms around his head. His body was limp in my arms. If it wasn't for the steady rise and fall of his chest against my thigh, I would have thought he was unconscious. Where have you been? I swear I looked all over Magic Kingdom for you. And where did you get that Mickey Mouse costume? He didn't answer. It was at this point that I became concerned. My son is normally very talkative. It was unlike him to be so reserved, especially after such a traumatic event. Why don't you take off that mask? I want to see that you are okay. I reached down to pull off his mask but he swatted my hands away with such force I staggered back a step. Never before had he hit me. The blow surprised me so much that I stood there, motionless on the sidewalk, for almost a minute, unsure of how to respond. Eventually though, I regained my wits and sat down on the bench next to him. I know you are scared, I said, but everything is alright now. We're together again. You're safe. Once again, no answer. Why aren't you talking to me? Are you hurt? No answer. I tried for several more minutes to get him to respond, but I might as well have been talking to a mannequin. All he would do was sit there unmoving on the bench, staring off into the distance through his mouse eyes. The only time he would move was to swat my hands away every time I tried to remove his mask. We sat on the bench for over an hour before I grabbed his hand and led him back to our hotel room. 
Luckily, he didn't resist as I maneuvered him through a crowd. To my surprise, he followed me with dog-like docility and even allowed me to tuck him into bed that night, Mickey Mouse costume and all. I debated that night whether to contact the park authorities about his disappearance and stolen suit, but decided against it. My gut was telling me that I should, but I was just too exhausted to prolong the matter. He seemed relatively unharmed for one thing, and we had to get to the airport by 6 the next morning. Calling the authorities would potentially extend our stay, and I couldn't afford to buy another pair of plane tickets. So, I kept the matter to myself, and drifted off into a light sleep the moment my head hit the pillow. We arrived home around sunset the next afternoon. My son still wasn't talking, and continued to swap my hands away every time I tried to remove his costume. At this point, my concern skyrocketed. Not only was his behavior so bizarre, but he hadn't eaten or drank anything in over a day. Unless he was sneaking food and water while I wasn't looking, he had to be on the drink of dehydration. I decided to take him to the doctor early that next morning. Something terrible had obviously happened to him while he was missing, and I felt like a failure of mother for waiting so long to get him help. When we arrived at the doctor's office, he threw such a fit that the nurses had to restrain him. No matter how hard they tried to remove his mask though, he always found a way to counter their efforts. It was as if that thing was plastered onto his head. Eventually, the doctor became so concerned that he decided to do an x-ray. He told me that it was the quickest way to assess his health through the costume, and that they would devise a plan while the x-ray process to remove his mask. I thanked him for his help and then watched as they escorted my son into another room. The doctor returned a few minutes later. His face was so pale, I feared that he might pass out. We finished the x-ray, he said, voice shaky. Thank goodness, I said. Is he alright? The doctor stared at me for almost a minute without responding, hands shaking. Is something wrong? His head and spinal cord are the only parts of him underneath the costume. The rest of his body is missing. I'm 20 years old, and I work at my town's local Ikea in Texas. Since I went to school during daytime, my boss put me on an overnight shift after the store closed at 11pm. This means I was working from 11 to roughly about 1am. I was basically a janitor, going around the store, mopping the floor, and cleaning and tidying whatever people used to touch or sit around in the furniture. Given that IKEA was a super center, there would still be a number of employees working during after hours. But for some reason, that night, I was one of only two other people going around the store to clean. It was around midnight, and I was dusting off some of the shelves in one of the concept living rooms when I heard someone's footsteps echoing in the distance behind me. This was odd as the store was closed over an hour ago, and no one was supposed to still be in the store's premises. I brushed it off as it was probably my coworker Carlos going around and doing his part, though it would be somewhat unusual for him to do that given that we basically never see each other while we're cleaning because the store is so big and we're assigned to clean our own areas of the store each time. I brushed it off and some time passed, I had eventually made my way to the children's bed section of the store. It wasn't my favorite part of the store, because it always was badly lit from the broken lamps overhead. I was making the beds when I noticed movement in the far corner of my vision. It was faint, like something ducking under one of the beds. I started to get pretty anxious by this point because I had just remembered the footsteps from earlier and connected the dots. Something was definitely off, and I realized that there's a high chance I'm not alone in this part of the store. I looked around, but obviously nothing. As much as I had my suspicions, 
I started to wonder if my mind just made up what I saw. A couple of minutes passed, and I was still very much on guard. That's when I heard a plastic cup hit the floor about a block away. It came from one of the kitchen rooms in the kitchen section, which was the last section I had to clean before I was done for the night. I stopped what I was doing and looked in the direction of the sound. All I saw was a cup in the middle of the alleyway. That made it real. My fight or flight started kicking in pretty intensely at this point as I tried to make sense of what was going on. I started to think someone was messing with me. Either my coworker or some random kids were playing some sort of prank to scare me. However, my coworker, Carlos, isn't the type to joke around and we barely talk either way. Though I figured whoever was doing this was trying to lure me in towards the cup. I decided to call out Carlos's name. Nothing. I told him if it was a prank, he should stop right now. During that moment, I was almost practically sure it was a joke and walked towards the cup to pick it up. Once I was there though, I noticed that one of the cupboards underneath the sink from the concept kitchen was slightly left open. My imagination was running wild at this point, so I slowly walked towards the cupboard and opened it completely to see if anyone was inside. That's when I saw a sickly looking man staring right at me. I immediately backed off a couple of feet away and he was still staring right at me with these creepy wide eyes and a sickly smile. He wasn't saying anything, just making very creepy eye contact with me, which was probably the scariest part. After about five long traumatizing seconds of this, I was creeped out enough and I ran to the nearest exit as fast as I could, leaving all my cleaning equipment behind. I went home and tried my best to forget about what just happened, but I couldn't get the image of this creepy face out of my head. The next day, I called my boss to tell him what happened last night and he was obviously taken aback and told me he was going to check that area for signs of someone. He called me back later in the day to tell me that they found crumbs of chips and cinnamon roll boxes in that cupboard, but nothing else. Ever since, I've kept working there, and we never again found traces of anyone living in the store. Even though I'm over it now, and come to realize it was probably a homeless man, I still can't get that haunting image of his creepy face out of my head, nor can I make sense of that cup falling over for no reason. I grew up in an affluent suburb on Long Island. My parents always took care of me, and I was lucky to lead such a great life, starting early. Nothing ever extremely terrible happened to us as a family. No sudden deaths, no money problems and my sister and I usually got everything that we wanted. I was a lucky kid to say the least. One day, the family took a day trip out to Ikea. I must have been about eight or nine. I forget what we were buying, but I remember it was large and it required some assembly. One of those items that you purchased and had to pick up the box in a different area of the store. My sister and my mother went to get the car, while my father and myself went to pick up the large item from the back. It was a particularly busy day. There were a lot of people, and workers seemed overwhelmed. My dad and I waited our turn for our number to be called on a couch located in the back of the room. There were TVs to watch. I think one of them had Nickelodeon on, so I didn't mind the wait. Finally, our number was called and my dad told me to wait on the couch while he picked up the box and brought it back over. Something happened as soon as he got to the counter, because he ended up waiting longer than he thought he should. As my dad left for the counter, I noticed two Hispanic men standing off to the side, just staring at me. As soon as they saw me looking at them, one came over. He was nervous kept checking back to his friend for approval. Finally, he reached me and asked in a shaky voice, is anyone sitting here? I simply replied, 
my dad, but he's up at the counter now. And the man sat down. I was a tall child, maybe 5'6", by the time I was in 6th grade. The legs of my pants never fit, they were always too short. My sister and I had this thing about collecting funny socks, so we all had different kinds with all different patterns. Each time we went shopping, we would beg our mom for a new pair or two to add to the collection. They would stick out of the bottoms of our pants for the world to see. I distinctly remember sitting as far away from the man as I physically could on the couch, jammed up against the arm. I was focusing so hard on the TV and trying to ignore him. He finally piped up. I really like those socks. Where did you get them? He spotted my socks. I remember they said, I love cats, with the picture of a cat on them. From Coles, I replied, trying with all my might not to have a conversation with this man. He inched closer on the couch, trying to put his arms around me. Why don't you come with me and my friend? We have fun toys for you to play with. I froze. I turned towards him. He had this nervous smile. I looked for my dad, still standing at the corner, waiting for the desk or whatever we bought that day. I knew that everything about this was wrong. I immediately jumped up and ran to my dad, pulling at his hand to let him know that I was next to him. This all happened in a matter of minutes, and to this day, it is still as traumatizing as it was 12 years ago. I burned the socks and haven't set foot in an Ikea since. All I could think about is what would have happened to me that day. I'm glad 8-year-old me had the sense not to go with the creep. A few years ago, it was in January. It was so cold that our town was all frozen, and the streets were very quiet back then. I was living on the second floor of the apartment building at that time, and I could see a small park and a bench in the direction of my balcony. One night, it was around 9 p.m. My cell battery had just died, so I went near the balcony to pick up my charger and I saw a child sitting on a bench about 30 meters away. It was snowing heavily outside at the time, so I thought it was a little weird for a child to sit on a bench alone in the middle of the night, especially on this cold day. However, I soon decided not to care about him, thinking that he's just waiting for his parents. Then I surfed the website for a while, and it was about 12 a.m. I went back to the balcony to lock the window, and that kid, he was still sitting on the bench. Looking at the back of his head, I began to worry that something might be wrong with him. So after thinking about it for a long time, I posted a post on the website I often go. Guys, there's a child out there in this time. Should I call the police? I then looked back at the bench. Maybe I can talk to him for a second. Thinking like this, I opened the window and shouted at the child. Hey! Hey, kid! He seemed not to hear my voice. He was just sitting there, not even looking at me. I shouted to him a few more times, then gave up. Went back to the living room, checking the comments, and there was one comment caught in my eyes. Hey, listen. That is not a human. Just shut the door and go to sleep. Do not talk to him. I got goosebumps. I slowly went out to the balcony again, and to my surprise, the child was gone. Was he a real ghost, or just gone somewhere? Thinking like this, I tried to shut the window that I had left open earlier, and looked down at the window inadvertently. And there was a child. He was standing in front of the first floor, still turning back. Holding my breath, I got so surprised that I quickly closed the window and locked it completely to the inner door. However, I ended up staying up all night that day. Eventually, nothing happened that day. 
but I still think it's the weirdest experience of my life. What if I didn't see his comment at that moment? Wouldn't that ghost have come into my house through the window? Of course, that kid may be a real person, but I still can't forget the back of his head. I grew up in what people would consider a bad household. My mom and dad were in a bad relationship, and they did nothing but argue every day. My mom would complain that my dad would stick in the basement almost every day and never spend any time with me, and my dad would always have the same response, that he's doing research down there. The only problem was that we were prohibited from going down to the basement. Three locks were built into the basement door, Nandy kept his one key on his old key ring. The key had a torn blue sticker at the bottom of it with a brown rusty tip. However, my mom finally got a hold of it somehow. And that same day when I came home from school, Dad suddenly told me she left us for another man. He seemed truly broken and sunk in his misery. So I tried acting, I mean, pretending to be normal at first but I couldn't stop crying like a baby when I finally got back in my room. After a few months of emotional breakdowns, my dad finally got over it. Furthermore, he started to visit the basement more consistently to the point where I would feel like I lived alone. I kept thinking my dad was working very hard since I saw him being very distraught after coming upstairs from the basement. I thought everything was fine until I started hearing noises at night. They weren't just regular noises. It was kind of someone's crying and scream of agony. But the most disturbing sound of all was the sound of growling, like some kind of beast would exist down in the basement. The next morning, I complained to my dad, but he acted like he had no idea what I was talking about as he walked past me to get ready for work. So I just shook it off, assuming that he was watching some horror movie down there or if I was just imagining the whole thing. I went back to my room. As it was the weekend, I was ready to catch up on some Saturday morning cartoons. I turned on my TV, and as I got ready to change the channel, I heard a familiar name. The news reporter was naming over 40 missing people in our town, and my mom was one of those names as they briefly showed her picture and information. I was confused about who would file a missing person report for her because my grandparents both died in a tragic car accident years ago. She had no siblings, and my dad told me she left us for another man. I wanted to inform my dad, but soon I was concerned it would make him depressed again. And in a way, I was still angry at her for leaving us. So I ignored it and changed the channel. A few minutes later, my dad came in to tell me he was leaving for work. He gave me a kiss on my forehead and informed me that he'd be back later that night. After he left, I invited my best friend Austin to come over. He then arrived shortly after and we played a game on my PlayStation. As we were about to plunge into the game, we suddenly heard a strange noise coming from the basement. What was that? Austin asked, being confused. I don't know. My dad does some kinds of experiments down there. It's probably a rat or something. Austin looked amused. No, dude, we can't go down there. My dad said so, I said quickly, bringing an end to Austin's excitement. It has no reason to doubt that Austin was disappointed. Then he asked for something to drink, so I went to the kitchen to get some juice for him. However, I was hit with a foul odor of something rotting as soon as I arrived in the kitchen. I looked around to see what could be the cause of the smell, and I found that the basement door was cracked open. I went to close it, but the curiosity got the best of me, so I called Austin to help me investigate. We darted down the stairs to the basement, clenching our noses at that horrible smell. It was dark until Austin found a light switch and quickly flicked it on. However, we had to regret our decision instantly after we saw the inside of the basement. There were people hanging from hooks with random limbs missing. As we were standing in horror, Austin clenched my shirt strongly. I could see the piles of feces and human remains contained within certain sections of the room. 
But the most disturbing and disgusting sight of all was the cage in the dark right corner of the room. The inside of it seemed to be a person sleeping at first. But as it looked up, I quickly realized that thing was not a person. Wh what is that? Austin shouted, shaking with fear. I ignored his question. Uh, to be more specific, I couldn't answer. That thing was indescribably frightening. It looked like a deformed human with its mouth filled with crooked and ragged teeth covering a majority of its face. Its face pointed outward with creases where the nose should be. The eyes were bulging out of its head as it fixated its glance toward Austin and me. Food, it said to us slowly with excitement and a malicious voice. Then it started clawing at the iron bars of the cage with its needle-like hands. I sat there in horror until Austin grabbed my wrist. We ran up the stairs scrambling for the escape and shut the door. After I made sure it was perfectly locked, I saw Austin sitting on the carpet floor with his knees to his chest. Once we had a few moments of silence, I then finally realized what really happened to my mom and those missing people in our town. At that instant, Austin muttered like this, Your dad, he was feeding those people to that thing. Now, what should I do now? Have you ever played with a corpse? It happened when I was a little kid, just before when I was about to enter kindergarten. I went to the small valley with my family, grandparents, and my relatives. I was such a brave child as I was too young at the time. Just relying on my little swim tube, I used to play alone deep in the valley water without wearing a life jacket and come out and eat watermelon. My siblings were a little older than me, but being scared, they didn't come in. So I always hit them and then went into the water to tease them. And the adults were sitting on a low wooden bench near the valley just watching us. After eating lunch, I got bored again. I think it was about after five or six. I went back to the water to play alone. Thinking back, it was totally crazy. I was circling about with my hips crammed in a tube carelessly. I was in a situation where I might die right away if the tube flips. But I was just looking up at the sky and thinking that the clouds were pretty at that time. Then, suddenly, the center of my swim tube was shaken a little bit. That was the moment. A girl who looks like a middle school student suddenly grabbed my arm. Her lips looked slightly purple, as if she had been playing in the water for a long time. Then she smiled and said, as if she was reassuring me, You're gonna fall off. Grab it tightly. She looked kinda older than me and I was just excited about the thing that she's gonna stay and play with me for a while. So I grabbed the tube and then I swam with her. While she dragged my tube, I couldn't even realize what time it is now. I had so much fun with her. About an hour later, she started to take me to a shallow place near the riverside. It's going to be cold soon. I'll take you to the adults, she said. But at that moment, my grandmother suddenly screamed and kept shouting my name. She was very old and she didn't even come into the water, but she hurriedly came into the water with her socks on and she lifted me up and then ran out. Grandma, what's wrong? What happened? I shouted. But as soon as I came out of the water, my family tried to cover my eyes so I couldn't see the valley. And my grandma was crying while saying that I was possessed by a ghost. I remember going to a temple or shaman's house for a while after that. A few years later, I asked my grandmother what happened that day and what she told me was a pure shock. The moment my grandmother looked at the valley to see if I was playing well alone, she saw that I was talking to myself while giggling and something black got stuck at the end of my tube and was wobbling together. Wondering what I was so funny about, she put glasses on to see me and that black thing. And at that moment, she saw that I was swimming around holding someone's black and long hair. Her heart sank. And as she decided to approach me quickly, she then saw the dead body slowly coming up. That's why she ran towards me. Now that I think about it, that memory didn't scare me at all, literally. However, I still can't forget the faces of those adults who saw the scene. This story is about my grandfather's experience. He died a long time ago. 
After he was declared dead at the hospital, we took the body home and put it in his room because my grandmother wanted to see him a little more before saying goodbye to her husband. But then, something happened. Two days later, the room door suddenly opened and my grandfather crawled out asking for water. Literally, my grandmother and all of the aunts just fainted, and only my uncles and my mom were barely awake. And I was just staring at this weird sight because I was too young at the time. I gave my grandfather a whole body massage after I brought him water, and on that day, the house was in chaos. A few months later, I went to my grandparents' house again, and he was so lively that I couldn't believe that he's the one who once died. One day I was sitting with my grandfather eating ice cream, and he started to tell me a story. On that day, my grandfather woke up in the hospital, and he noticed that everyone was crying. He asked them why they were crying, but no one answered, so he was just standing there. And then a man in a black suit called him outside the hospital room. Without time to think, he began following him, and he started to feel a little bit sad rather than scared. The crying sound from behind gradually decreased, and as he walked along with the man, he could see the village where he used to live as a child. There was a river at his feet that he had never seen before, and the river was really, really red. So he got goosebumps. The man was walking on the surface of the water, and he pressed my grandfather to come over quickly. So the moment he tried to follow him, he was also walking on the water. After crossing the river, he then saw a black wooden structure long past the wasteland. When he was about to pass the gate, a woman in black mourning came out from the inside and kicked him out, saying, No, you brought the wrong person. If you want to live another three years of your life, go and ignore everyone you meet. Do not look back. Just follow the four-legged animal. The woman said like this and disappeared into the house with the man. So my grandfather was going back the way he came. And then he saw one of his friends who had died a few years ago standing there. He beckoned him to come closer, but my grandfather ignored him, thinking what the woman had said just before. Even if his friend cursed at him. After that, he met other friends, but he ignored all of them and just passed by. The moment he arrived at the river again, there was a bridge that was not there before. At that moment, he saw his daughter who had died of fever when she was young standing in front of the bridge. He could not ignore his daughter. So he approached and she stretched out her hand as if she wanted him to hold it for her. As soon as he was about to hold that hand, something pulled on his legs. When he looked down, he saw a white dog that had been raised by him a long time ago was biting his pants and dragging frantically as if he should not hold that hand. It's like he was telling him to cross the bridge immediately. He stepped back from his daughter quickly, and that was the moment when she suddenly rushed to him. Her mouth almost ripped to the ear, and she repeated like this, I'm going to catch you. I'm going to take you. She was running toward him with a rope in her hand, and it was horrifying. He started to run toward the bridge, and the dog was barking at the ghost and guarded behind him. As soon as he crossed the bridge, that thing vanished with loud crying, and the dog was still barking as if he was telling him to hurry. He looked back when he was far away from the bridge, and then realized that the river, the bridge, the neighborhood, and the dog were all gone. The surrounding area was as white as a sheet. It was the moment when he finally opened his eyes and he found himself lying in his bed. Grandfather also told this story to his local friends, and the oldest man told him a story that had been told by a shaman. There's a ghost that brings the dead who met with violent death, and he suggested that the ghost that Grandfather saw seemed to be that kind of type. If ghosts lack a place to live in the afterlife, they would take the dead to build a new house. Anyway, after that, my grandfather lived really well for the rest of the three years, as the woman in the dream had said, and then he passed away while taking a nap on the same day he first died.
three years ago. After that, I kept recalling my grandfather's lonely face while he told me a story at that time. My grandfather was not the type who originally believed in ghosts. While he was alive, he always cut the weeds around the grave and brought some drinks and snacks for the grave's owners whenever he saw the ownerless graves around his town. This, of course, is just my grandfather's very personal experience, so it's okay to think of it as just a novelty story, because he told me exactly the same thing. I guess he absolutely went to heaven, but I just miss my grandfather. It was summer in small town New Mexico. I was about 15 years old at the time, and since school was out, I was doing a few odd jobs around town to earn some money. Mowing lawns, walking dogs, anything that could make me a few bucks, you know. There was this one guy who lived in my town, an older gentleman in his early 70s, Mr. Lesnar. He used to be a teacher at my school, but I hadn't seen him for at least a year. He was bald, with a big white beard. Put a red suit on the guy and he could have passed as a mall Santa. I always remembered him as being a nice, friendly guy, so when I bumped into him in town, I asked if there was anything he needed help with. He said there was. He needed help reorganizing a few parts of his house, said that he'd pay me 50 bucks if I helped him. When you're 15 years old, having $50 in your pocket feels like being a millionaire. I took him up on it. The next day rolled around, and I went over to Mr. Lesnar's house and knocked on the door. He answered with a smile on his face and invited me inside. First thing that struck me was the stench. His house had that old person smell about it. I didn't know much about the guy to be honest. I mean, yeah, he used to teach at my school, but all I really remembered about him was how he always wore socks with sandals and how he always spent every school vacation down in Mexico. I started off by cleaning up in the kitchen. Once I'd finished, Mr. Lesnar told me that he wanted help boxing up some things in the basement. Said he had too much junk down there, and that he wanted to reorganize and get rid of a load of it. Told me to start boxing things up, and to come and tell him when I'd finished. There must have been a set of twelve stairs that led down into this strangely large, stale-smelling basement. Mr. Lesnar flicked the light switch. Alone, dusty light bulb illuminated the basement. I grabbed a few folded up cardboard boxes and made my way down. So, there I was, just boxing all sorts of things up in this grungy basement. Must have spent about 45 minutes down there by myself. While I was working, I happened to lean against a particular spot on the wall. When I leant on it, I came across something odd. A loose panel in the basement wall. Not a broken part of the wall, mind you. I mean, this panel was intentionally loose. Well, curiosity got the better of me, and I started fumbling with it. It came right off. Behind the panel was a small compartment. Hidden inside that compartment was a box. It felt like finding a hidden treasure chest. I checked to see if Mr. Lesnar was standing behind me at the top of the stairs. The coast was clear. I knew I probably shouldn't, but I pulled out the box. I lifted off the top, curious to see what the old man was hiding inside. At first, it didn't look like there was much in it. A journal, a few knickknacks, and a small pile of photographs, maybe ten or twelve in total. I took out the photos. My heart immediately sank after looking at the top one. At first, I could hardly believe the image. It showed Mr. Lesnar with a pistol in his hand, kneeling down next to a dead woman lying in the dirt. Her lifeless eyes were staring into the camera lens. She was clearly Mexican and had obviously been shot. The second photo was almost identical, only this time it was a male who stared lifelessly at the camera. No, no, this can't be real, I thought. I flicked through all the pictures, every damn one each one telling the same story. They all showed Lesnar, knelt down next to some bloody, human game, sprawled out on the ground in front of him. All of the victims varied wildly in age. 
I was writing on the backs of all the photos, but it was all in Spanish, and I couldn't make it out. Still, I knew instantly what this was. A box full of sick mementos from Lesnar's trips to Mexico, hidden away from the world in a small wall compartment. In some photos, Lesnar looked younger. In others, he appeared to be in his mid-sixties. In all of them, he was kneeling down next to his victims, with the same disturbing grin on his face, posing like a hunter with his trophies. I was overcome by this weird mixture of shock, disgust, anger, and, most of all, fear. Fear that I was in the basement of the monster in these photos. Without thinking, I shoved the images back inside the box and slid the container back into the wall. I desperately fumbled with the wall panel, trying to put it back in the exact same way it was, not wanting the old man to realize that I'd discovered his horrible secret. I'd just about got the damn thing back in place when I heard a creaking at the top of the basement stairs behind me. I turned to see old man Lesnar standing by the basement door, looking down at me. I have never felt more like a rat in a cage. Looks like you're doing a good job, he said. My heart skipped a beat. I just mumbled something and tried to act like nothing was wrong. Oh, don't mind me. I'm just going upstairs for a nap. You keep on going down there. With that, he slowly turned and walked off through the hallway. There was maybe twenty seconds of silence before I heard his footsteps making their way up the stairs to his bedroom. My mind was racing. Had he seen me fiddling with the panel? Did he know that I'd found his photos? Oh god, was I in danger? I was only a scrawny kid. I decided not to stay down there wondering. I waited for a few moments before bolting up the basement staircase. I dashed towards the front door, grabbed the handle and twisted. No good. The damn thing had been locked from the inside. I figured the old man had just locked it before he went upstairs. I scanned the door to see if there was a way to quickly open it. No time. I could hear movements above me. The old man was walking back out of his bedroom and towards the stairs. I sprinted through the hallway and into the kitchen. I knew from the cleaning earlier there was a back door there. I grabbed the handle and prayed. With a twist, it flung open. It felt like winning the lottery. I flew out of that house, ran around the property and back onto the main street. I looked back only once. When I did, I saw the old man's face in one of the downstairs windows. He looked to be holding something. I was too far away to make out what it was exactly, but I bet you can guess what I thought it was. From there, I kept on running until I got home, thankful that the old man lived in a cul-de-sac and not in the middle of nowhere. If he did, I'm certain he'd have taken a shot at me. It goes without saying that I told my parents what I'd found. We notified the authorities about it, and I told them about the secret panel and the sick mementos in the box. When they checked the place out, they did indeed find the secret compartment. Predictably, it was totally empty. There was no box hidden inside, no evidence of any wrongdoing whatsoever. They figured I was just messing with the old guy or something, and decided not to look into him any further. I don't know what Lesnar did with the pictures, whether he destroyed them or hid them elsewhere but he got away with it all regardless. Old man Lesnar lived another eight years after that. In that time, I graduated high school, went off to college, and moved out of town. My parents always lived in that same place, however. For all the time I lived there after that incident, and whenever I'd go back to visit my parents, I'd always be looking over my shoulder. I knew that Mr. Lesnar wanted to take his secret to the grave and I always worried that he'd try and silence me to do so. It's hard to believe there are people like this, who, to the outside world, are leading seemingly ordinary lives. I'm glad I didn't become his last trophy. When I was about 12, I was walking home from school with friends. Like usual, after we got to the main road, I was on my own, because I lived farther away than the other kids. One day I noticed that a little white pickup truck had passed me quite a few times. But being the naive little girl that I was, I assumed that they were merely lost. I realized that the pickup seemed to be following me when it turned onto my neighborhood, at which point I ran as fast as I could to get to my house. Again, I wasn't certain that the truck was following me, so I kind of brushed it off. 
I considered myself safe once inside my house. I went about my usual after-school routine, kicked off my shoes, turned on the TV, grabbed a snack out of the fridge, and let my two dogs in from the outside. As I'm about to sit down and enjoy my snack, I hear a car door slam. I run over to the blinds, and sure enough, I see the little white truck sitting in my driveway. A few seconds later, there was a knock at my door, and me being the stupid kid that I was, answered it for whatever reason. I opened the door and saw the man that was driving earlier in the pickup truck. He was sweaty and just stared into my eyes. I asked him what he wanted, but he didn't say anything. It was one of the most awkward moments of my life, and I remember the encounter so vividly. I was just about to ask him again when he suddenly tried to force his way into my house. I slammed the door as hard and as fast as I could and somehow managed to lock it as well. My two trusty beagles started to bark. He bangs on the front door for a few minutes and then proceeds to the backyard where he starts to bang on the back door. What did this guy want? I crawled my way to the kitchen because that's where our landline was. I called my grandpa who lived down the street because I figured he could get to me faster than the police could. My grandpa told me he would be at my house in less than five minutes and to call the police after I hung up. At this point, I started to scream and beg the man banging on my door not to kill me as I cried hysterically. But no, he was hitting heavily on the door, harder and harder. That's when I really started to get scared for my life. So I decided to go hide somewhere upstairs. Running upstairs, I noticed the banging stop. So I go back over to the blinds and see that the pickup is gone. My grandpa showed up a few seconds later. I run over to him and tell him that the man left right before he got there. As I'm telling my grandpa all of this, I see the truck pass by my street as it headed towards the neighborhood entrance. I try to point it out, but I'm guessing I wasn't making much sense because he just pushed me back towards my house. There was no sign of the guy, other than him leaving the garden gate open and a picture that I took from our security camera footage. I never ended up calling the cops, although I should have. From that day on, I had to go to my grandpa's house after school every day for a few months. Though we talked about the incident with my family, I never really heard about or saw that man again. But one thing was for sure, I really thought I was going to die that day. Around Christmas this time of year, I moved into a new house that was built back in the 1940s if I remember correctly. It's an old home that, like any other, makes a bunch of strange noises at night. I'm not normally one who gets scared easily, so staying here alone wasn't going to bother me. Luckily, for the first two weeks of living here, I had two friends rooming with me as they looked for an apartment. They had just moved to the city, and I allowed them to stay here while they found another place to live. My friends finally found an apartment the second week after we moved into the house, and moved out that weekend while I was at work. I had specifically mentioned to one of them who had the front door key to leave it on the counter when they left so I could get it back from them. When I returned home from work, I found that the key wasn't there, as they'd forgotten to leave it when they officially moved out. It wasn't a problem, and I wasn't concerned as I had the back door to get in and out of the house, and my friend promised to get it back to me the next day. Fast forward to the next evening, and I decided to watch a couple movies while kicking back and enjoying my official first night at home alone in the new house. I waited for my friend to come by and drop off the key for a while while I watched movies, but she didn't stop by. After texting her, she said that her boyfriend, the other friend, roommate, had to stay later at work, and since he had a car, she couldn't drop the key off that night and promised to bring it by first thing in the morning before she went to work at a coffee shop down the street at 5 a.m. After finishing up my last movie for the night, I went to bed and ended up having a rather vivid and frightening nightmare. Before I describe to you the nightmare that I had, I've made a quick diagram of what the layout of my dream bedroom looked like, which you can see here on the screen. So in my dream, I was laying on the bed with a friend. It was very dark in my bedroom, but there was a light source coming from somewhere, and I was able to see where everything was. I heard the sound of clothes falling on the floor, so I sat up and looked down the hall where the bathroom was. Clothes were piled up on the floor of the bathroom door. I remember being perplexed as to why and how these were here and I thought that they had fallen or were thrown from the closet. That's when I heard my friend say, I'm scared. Me too, I replied. We decided to get up and move to another part of the house, away from the bedroom. On our way out, I looked down the hall and some thing peeked around the corner of the hall from out of the closet. It was some shadowy figure and I could tell that it was bald. And my brain made me assume that it was wearing a suit. And no, it's not a Slenderman if that's what you're thinking. 
What really freaked me out was that this thing moved so unnaturally human. It moved in a really jerky fashion, twitching or glitching, and it really scared me. Get out, I screamed. Leave. You don't belong here. And the more I yelled at it, the more it jerked back and forth, as if it were stuck between a doorway of the closet. I ran towards the thing while screaming at it, and right when I reached it, it slipped back into the closet. I immediately ran into the closet and flipped on the switch, only to find nothing there. That's when I woke up. I was so shaken by the nightmare that I was too afraid to open my eyes and fear that I would see something standing next to my bed if I did. I attempted to fall back asleep, but it was so quiet in the house and I was pretty disturbed by my dream that I decided to turn the TV on and drown out the silence and take my mind off the nightmare. I remember checking my phone and seeing that it was about 4 a.m. After watching about 15 to 20 minutes of television, I became sleepy and decided to try and fall back asleep. I turned off the TV and prepared to fall asleep. About 10 minutes passed when I heard knocking come from somewhere in the house. I know I heard it because my cat, who usually sleeps with me on my bed, perked up and was staring outside of my bedroom door. She quickly jumped off the bed to go investigate, and I ignored the knocking sound because I had assumed that it was my friend dropping off the key. Since it was almost 5 a.m., and that's when she said she would come by, I finally fell asleep. The next morning I woke up, and the first thing I did was check the mailbox for the key. It wasn't there. I was a bit frustrated and decided to go to my friend's work to grab the key from her. I was told that she wasn't in that day. I gave her a call, which went straight to voicemail, and shortly after I left a message. I received a text from her claiming that she had woken up at 6 a.m. with an upset stomach and had called into work, and that I should just stop by to pick up the key. Apart from the complications of getting the key, I thought about the nightmare I had earlier that morning and the knocking I heard shortly after when I'd woken up from the dream. I found it odd that even if my friend did stop by to drop off the key, she would knock on the door. It would have been as if she assumed that I would be awake to greet her, or that I would wake up in order to greet her and get the key. The more I thought about the knocking, the more I remember specifically not sounding like a knocking on the door, but more like a tapping on glass. We have a glass sliding door in the kitchen that I used a while while my friend had the front door key, and the sliding door leads into a fenced off backyard. I started to think about why someone would even be in my backyard between 4.30 at 5 in the morning, or why they would even tap on the glass in the first place. It didn't make very much sense. I shrugged it off and decided to go about my day, starting off with watering my plants in the kitchen that sit on the countertop that's below three small kitchen windows. I opened the blinds to let in more sunlight, and what I saw scared the absolute fuck out of me. The photo you're about to see is what I saw when I opened my blinds. You have the decision to believe me or not, but I can swear on my life and the life of everyone that I know that I did not do this, and that was not there the day before. It was a bizarre string of events that led up to seeing this, which is why it freaked me out. I don't know what was outside of my window early that morning, but someone, or something, was. A few years ago, I did something terrible. Sometimes I really wish I didn't. Something I can never take back, honestly. It all started when my girlfriend, or well, ex-girlfriend, broke up with me. I know this might seem trivial and just a part of life is growing up as a person. However, unfortunately for me, it had a complete reverse effect. I know all you think I'm childish and I just needed to take it on the chin and deal with it. You might be right, but I didn't. I helped her with everything within her life. I wasn't going to allow that to happen unpunished. I know it was petty and it was wrong, but you have to understand I was desperate. I was hurting. It honestly felt as though my heart was aching. It was throbbing so hard I honestly thought at any point I would explode. I know that sounds dramatic and I'm honestly not looking for sympathy. I'm not the victim here. Well, not anymore. I made sure of that. I honestly could feel my body shaking with rage, so I got up with hatred and darkness in my heart and I booted up my laptop. I wasn't a stranger to the dark web. I've spent countless hours trying and failing to navigate it to help with my boredom. I only ever found the usual rabbit holes falling into the typical drug and honey trap sites and forums. I just wanted for her to hurt. I wanted her to feel the embarrassment I had felt and suffered at her hands. My original plan, although very distasteful and wrong, wasn't malicious. 
It wasn't violent in any way. I just wanted to humiliate her. I still had photos and videos from our time together. You know, personal videos and photos of her. And in my pent up anger and depressed state, I thought it was a good idea to use these against her. I see now I was wrong from the start, but I wish I had only done that. As awful as it seems, that was nothing to what I actually did. I kept digging and digging, clicking link after link until eventually I clicked on the link and I found something that caught my attention. It was a form, a form called the naughty list. On the site was a question. Do you know someone who has been bad? If so, maybe you should put them on a naughty list. Perfect, I thought. This has got to be it. I upload all my personal photos and videos on there and maybe link her social media and we'll see who's laughing then. I thought about adding her address, but she was back living with her family and even I drew the line there. The form wasn't what I expected though. You couldn't just upload to their homepage. There were different sections on it or punishments as they called it. I remember thinking how dramatic it was, how dumb and naive I was. There were several different sections, Elf on the Shelf, Krumpus Cramps, and Frozen Fields, among others. It kind of made me chuckle, I guess. That's why I just didn't think it was anything serious. Anyway, with the sections, Elf on the Shelf kind of made me crack a smile. But that's not what I went with. I chose something called Slay Snatcher. I don't know why I just did. It was kind of funny to me. After clicking on it, I had to wait a good minute and a half before this bright white page loads up, filled with a few black text boxes and a text that read, Santa is waiting for this write-up. Write up his naughty list. Please fill in the details and he'll do the rest. I thought to myself, that's cute. I just thought it was kind of stupid, but I filled it in regardless. It was name, age, and birthday and links to the person's social media. It was all there. Everything I was so desperately looking for, and of course, photo uploads. Jackpot, I remember smiling to myself, halfway cackling in the process. It wouldn't allow me to upload any videos, but the photos were more than enough for me. It was hot girl summer type pictures, if you know what I mean. It also asked for the person's address, but as I previously said, I wasn't really about to go that far, but I did write in her hometown our hometown, something I really wish I didn't do. After I had finished putting in her information without even a moment's hesitation, I clicked submit. After a few seconds, a little text box appeared asking, are you sure? Santa won't forget. He checks that list twice. All names are final. I smugly pressed yes, and that was that. Perfect, I thought, until I was redirected to another page. It took a few minutes to upload, but when it did, it caught me off guard. It simply said, thank you for submitting the naughty list. We really appreciate it. I had achieved my goal. I thought job done. It's all uploaded. People will see them and message her on social media. Then she'll be humiliated, feeling better about myself. I calmly and confidently shut down and wiped everything correctly, making sure I couldn't be traced or implicated in any way. The next morning I woke with the biggest and most disturbing smile I've ever produced. I was so pleased with myself looking back on it now. It honestly makes me feel sick. I couldn't wait to see the fruits of my labor. I was so excited to see her suffer. I wanted to break her and for her to feel as worthless as she had made me feel. To my absolute dismay and disappointment, nothing happened. I waited and I waited, but nothing. No angry phone calls or texts. No outraged social media posts. Nothing at all. I thought maybe at first she could have been trying to ignore it. Or maybe she reported the abuse and had been told not to engage any potential troll or creeper. I mean, surely it worked, right? I mean, there's no way I could check. I couldn't find that link again, even if I tried. Anyone who surfed the deep web or dark web would know this is true. It's just not cataloged. It's a mess. And I only stumbled across it by chance in the first place. I wish I hadn't. So a few more days go by, and by now my excitement was faded and I feel dejected and genuinely upset that it clearly hadn't worked. No one could be so calm if it had worked. And I couldn't exactly ask her to go check. That would just point the finger straight at me. So after a while, I just gave up. In truth, the whole ordeal was now tiresome to me. And as sad as it sounds, it has strangely made me feel better. Like I hadn't gotten it all out of my system somehow. A few more days later, 
I was awoken to a loud knock on my door. Previous drama of my former relationship had completely escaped my mind at this point. And just for some context, I live alone and don't get many visitors at all. So I was more annoyed than curious to see who was at my door. So you can imagine my shock when I flung open my door to be greeted by the stern faces of two police officers. Shit, I thought to myself, this is it, I'm going to prison. Everyone is going to think I'm some kind of freak, which I guess in all fairness, I was at the time. They asked to come in and I of course obliged. I said, come on. I remember thinking at the time, they've only asked me to come in. As of right now, I'm not under arrest or anything, so I better see what they want. But what they asked me completely and utterly knocked the wind out of me. When was the last time you saw Katie? I was speechless and for a second, I must have looked like the most guilty and suspicious person in the world. Realizing this, I quickly shook the look of surprise and dread off my face and answered as calmly as I could muster. Not since we broke up, around two weeks ago. This was true, but it didn't save me from the barrage of intense scrutiny and questioning. Where were you on the night of? I told them the truth at home. Can anyone verify this? I said, uh, no. I live alone, but I get dropped off at home after work by one of my colleagues, which is routine after every shift, so I can, I guess. And what time was this? I told him the truth around 10.30, and the cameras at work would show me leaving at around 10.20, and it's only about a 10-minute drive here. Did you leave your property at any other point after you returned? No. I told the cops that there's a camera by the apartment's entrance that will show I'm telling the truth. His face, intense stare, and concentration into my eyes seemed to waver and loosen slightly. So I thought I'd push my luck and ask what this was all about. He stated that although he can't give me details on an ongoing investigation, Katie had been reported missing. She was last seen by her mother leaving their home to shop and browse the stores but never return. The police officers left soon after that and actually thanked me for my time. They did check the CCTV and with my boss and colleague who confirmed my story and that I was telling the truth. Days turned into weeks and still nothing. It seemed as though she just had vanished into thin air. I couldn't believe it. It couldn't have been because of me. I thought maybe it's possibly some creep stalked her socials and found her address after I posted them along with the images, but surely it had to be a coincidence. That stupid form couldn't be real. It said Santa's naughty list. That definitely couldn't be real. The longer it went on, the more horrible I felt. I know I wasn't physically responsible, but in one way or another, I had caused this, or at least put the wheels in motion. I felt just as guilty as if I had done something to her. I mean, this is the girl I once loved, the girl I still love, and I had done this. I had caused this and her poor mother, they had been estranged for years. I tried to get on normally with my life, but it was hard. I couldn't sleep, I couldn't eat, and you know something, I knew I deserved it. I would cringe every time I caught myself feeling sorry for myself. I took the drinking to make myself sleep. Anything to numb the pain, anything to get the image of her face and the sounds of her screams out of my head. I couldn't go to the police, but how could I? If I confessed, my life was as good as over. As selfish as it was, I just didn't believe it would even help to find her if I did. Maybe I was just being a coward, but it was hopeless. She was gone. I waited every morning for an update. I would always call the police station to get an update. It was torture until one day. They did find her, but as I'm sure you all can already tell, this story doesn't have a happy ending. But she was eventually found in an old abandoned factory in the outskirts of the next town over. I just couldn't believe it. I could feel my throat tighten to the point I was struggling to breathe when I heard the news. In my head, I was begging and pleading with whoever or whatever. It must be some kind of mistake, a mix-up. It couldn't be because of me. But unfortunately, it was no mix-up. She was found stuffed in a chimney. Her body was inside a sack, a toy sack. I couldn't believe it. I felt sick. This must be some kind of sick joke. I kept trying and failing to convince myself. I felt my body tremble. She had been there for a while, and you could tell by looking at her. They knew it was her because stuffed into her eye socket was a small piece of paper, a small piece of paper that read, Naughty List, Katie, you should have been good. I blacked out, and I collapsed where I was standing, and I hit my head pretty hard. 
when I regained consciousness, I hoped, I prayed. It was just a bad dream. But of course it wasn't. It was real. It was all real. I'm a simp. Nothing will ever make up for the torture I subjected a girl I once loved and cherished. All because of my own ego and misguided sense of pride and self-worth. I wish I could take it all back. You deserve justice, Katie. You deserve to be able to rest in peace at the very least. Maybe confessing will bring you and your family closure. Maybe ending my own life will make us even. But regardless of the answer, I'm far too much of a coward for either. I won't go on the dark web again, just because of this situation. I'm only 14 years old, but I'm very tech savvy. I enjoy hacking computers and even building them from time to time. One of my more recent and morbid hobbies has been exploring the deep web. Before you get the wrong idea, I don't go there for the dark stuff. Well, I do, but not the kind of stuff you're thinking about. I explore the deep web for the joy of finding new websites. Brand new, off-kilter, bizarre ones. I find them and catalog them for my own personal enjoyment. It feels like I'm actively discovering new parts of an ever-growing planet, or at least the dark side of one. Despite it being the deep web, most of the sites I've come across are mundane and uninspiring. For instance, a 9-11 conspiracy site, a dating site for white supremacists, and a site dedicated to assassinating the president. Boring. But then there's some more interesting ones, like a marketplace for selling various serial killers' belongings, a site for worshipping a strange cult called the Clan of the Red Wolf, and a Hitler fan fiction site, violent hypersexual fan fiction, to name a few. These are the kinds of sites that either pique my interest or make me laugh, giving them a spot in my catalog of oddities. While on my usual hunt for the unusual, I came across a site called Parent Snatcher. The layout was very simple and looked more like someone's Tumblr page rather than a deep web website, but I wanted to see what it had to offer. In reading its contents, I found little to placate my hunger for the strange and obscene. It was just a list of pronouns and numbers coupled with links to eBay listings on the surface web selling furniture. Her, 37. eBay listing. Love seat, $14,356. Him, 28. eBay listing. Sofa, 11467 Her, 42. eBay listing. Drapes, 12569 You get the drift. It's just more of the same after that. The setup confused me. Doing a little more digging, I found various number sequences embedded into the background of the site. Being a fan of encryption, I wondered if it might be a code of some sort. I took down the series of numbers and ran it through one of my many code-breaking programs that I had on my computer. After an hour or so, it popped out a message. Welcome to Parent Snatcher. Need a new mom or dad? Not satisfied with the one you have? Well, you've come to the right place. Follow a her listing for a mother unit and a him listing for a father unit. Ages are included in description. Once payment is received by eBay user, we will send you your new parent. All of our human products come with a lifetime guarantee. We monitor the bonding process 24-7 for quality control. They are equipped with a tracking chip and video surveillance, making it impossible for them to escape. We here at Parent Snatcher Desire your full satisfaction above all else. Enjoy. Now, that was weird. I've certainly never seen anything like that on the deep web. This was certainly getting a special place in my catalog, whether it was fake or not. After saving the site into my collection, I wondered, what if it actually worked? This is going to sound stupid, but I always wanted a dad. It's been me and my mom for as long as I can remember. She says he left when I was young, but I don't recall him ever being there. As such, I would often fantasize about him returning home, seeing me all grown up, and wanting to be a part of my life again. Like I said, it's stupid. Still, I really wanted to know if the site worked. I tried a thousand of different search engines, and asked around on forums on both the deep web and the surface web. Not a single mention of Parent Snatcher anywhere. I finally ripped my eyes from my computer monitor and looked over at the clock. It was nearly three in the goddamn morning. 
I'd been searching for information on this one site for several hours, and for one reason or another, I couldn't let it go. Maybe it was my need for a father figure, or perhaps it was the sleep deprivation. Either way, I found myself walking upstairs to my mom's bedroom. Once there, I snuck past her asleep on the bed and reached into her purse located on one of her nightstands. I grabbed her wallet and quietly walked back downstairs to my room. I grabbed one of her credit cards, followed the cheapest dad listing on Parent Snatcher to the Surface Web, and clicked on the Buy It Now option for a ceiling fan. I typed in all of the credit card information required and then paused for a moment. I was about to not only break my mom's trust and spend a boatload of her money, but I was also doing something potentially dangerous. What if the man I purchased wasn't nice? What would my mom say or do when he got here? What if there would be no man at all? What if the site was just a carefully orchestrated scam designed in swindling unsuspecting kids out of their parents' money? I asked myself these questions, but they barely made a dent in my curiosity. I hit enter and finalized the process. After sneaking the card back into my mom's purse without being noticed, I waited. Days passed. Those days eventually became weeks. I had to put up with my mom arguing on the phone with her credit card company, as well as eBay, over the mysterious $3,000 purchase made with her card. She never once suspected me of doing the deed, even venting to me about it from time to time. That made me feel guilty. My guilt, however, was no match for my excitement. I could not wait to see if Parent Snatcher was legitimate. The weeks that passed eventually turned into a month. This is when I started becoming weary of the site's claims. I began to accept the fact that I was a dumb kid, fooled by a master con artist. I was left feeling helpless and like an idiot. I had been fantasizing about a scenario in which the site not only worked, but sent me a nice man to be my dad. He would meet me, meet my mom, and they would fall in love. We would be a family. I knew the chances were slim, but I still hoped. I was a fool. One night while on my computer, searching for more deep web gems, I heard a loud bang. It sounded like it was the front door. A burglar, perhaps? I jumped up from my computer and grabbed the baseball bat I kept under my bed. I was ready to fight off any would-be intruder. After getting into a fighting stance, I heard someone shuffling around outside my bedroom. My adrenaline was through the roof. I stood my ground and wound up the bat, ready to swing. My bedroom door swung open. It was a man, wearing all black, including a black ski mask. He looked me up and down, apparently sizing me up before speaking. Are you the one who placed an order with Parent Snatcher? Struck with confusion, I nodded. The man then bolted in my direction and grabbed me. He put his hand over my mouth and pulled me out of my room. I struggled, but he was too strong. Just before he could get me out of the house, I attempted to bite his hand through the leather glove he was wearing. I clenched my teeth as hard as I could and managed to get a reaction. The man ah! groaned in pain. That's when I was able to wiggle my way free and run towards the stairs all the while screaming at the top of my lungs for my mom to wake up. The man caught up quick and grabbed me again, but my cries for help were effective. My mom showed up at the top of the stairs, just in time to see what was going on. My mom screamed and leapt down the flight of stairs, faster than I've ever seen any person move in my life. She began bashing the guy's head in with her fist, making it nearly impossible for him to hold on to me. He threw some punches back, but I wasn't going to let him get away with laying his dirty hands on my mom. I stretched my leg back as far as it would go, kicked him so hard in his nether regions that he fell to the floor. He still tried fighting back, but my mom and I had the upper hand. He eventually ran from the door and fled from the premises. It's been a few weeks since that man broke into our home. I can only guess that he really did work for Parent Snatcher, but the sight wasn't what I hoped it was. It seemed that its goal was not only to make money, but also to kidnap kids. Once they have a billing address, they probably canvass the area for a few weeks and make sure the house in question actually harbors a child or teen. I didn't figure all that out on my own. If I was able to think that far ahead, I wouldn't have wound up in this mess to begin with. I told my mom the truth as well as the police. They figured out the rest. 
Unfortunately, the site was taken down, and the perpetrators were never apprehended. The cops are still on the lookout, though, and offered my mom and I police detail and new security system. So, despite the ordeal, we sleep well. What would Parent Snatcher have done if they had actually captured me? The police wouldn't offer me insight on this, but I'm sure they told my mom. I already have a good guess and he went into some kind of child trafficking ring. I'm sure you can gather what would have happened. Luckily for me, I wasn't captured. So all in all, I've learned a lot from nearly being kidnapped. And one thing is for certain. I will never visit the deep web again for as long as I live. I'm a fresh graduate student with a bachelor's degree in science, nutrition to be specific. Around five months ago, I was looking for a decent job that's related to what I've studied. The pandemic certainly made the job hunting even more stressful. However, I got a job in a moderate R&D-based company two weeks after my application for the job. I was quite fussy over the fact that the company had some pretty bad reviews on the job-seeking website regarding the pay and the working environment, but I had to work to earn my living, so I thought nothing of it. I held the position of lab technician, where my routine is basically doing some inspections, laboratory tests on raw materials, in-process and final products, and supporting more complex trials and experiments. So basically, I stay in the lab unless my supervisor asks me to run calibration checks or to do some maintenance like a simple repair to analytical instrumentation. This incident occurred around three weeks after I started working. I was doing my lab tests and had to wait for an hour or so to proceed to the next step of the test. So I sat in the corner of the lab and started to doze off because my bedtime schedule had been messed up ever since the lockdown. I don't know how long it had been till I heard someone come into the room. I thought it must have been some intern students who usually come into the lab to prepare for some lab tests, so I wasn't too bothered to look at who or what they were doing. A moment later, I heard the sound of someone messing with the incubator, like pushing random buttons in a quick motion, which is quite abnormal because the incubator is normally already set up readily so there's no need to adjust the temperature. I was about to tell the other person to stop messing with the buttons when the noise stopped and it was quiet again. I was sitting down with my knees to my chest, resting against the table that's placed in the middle of the lab parting the laminar flow cabinets. So if I had to see who it was, I need to stand up and face the other side. But I was sleepy, so I decided to just brush it off. When the person was about to leave the room, I glanced over and saw something that is not of a human's legs. It looked like a fishtail standing upright, like in the animated cartoon movie Shark Tail. It was moist and had the color of dirty, muddy green. I just sat there, shocked, contemplating if whatever I saw was real or just a hallucination due to my lack of sleep. Anyhow, I just stopped fretting over it and resumed my work. About a month after, I was early to work on this particular day, and my supervisor had asked me to check on the raw materials as soon as possible to avoid any miss out. So I went to the room where the raw materials are stored, which is located down at the manufacturing plant. When I reached the working area, there were only a few workers and the atmosphere felt a little eerie. Nevertheless, I went straight to the storeroom, did my work, and was about to leave when I heard alarms going off in the nearby storeroom where the dry goods are kept. I rushed to the place and there were people surrounding the room. I took a glimpse of the inside, and it seemed that the dry goods were contaminated or rather eaten by a pest. It was weird seeing the size of the goods that were eaten. It was as though some large animal took bites of the dry goods, and the rotten goods had musty green thick liquid all over them. I was a little shocked too, but I had to do my job, so again I thought nothing of it. Nothing really happened after that until two weeks ago when I saw those fishtails again. I was working on calibration and doing decontamination of a machine when someone walked past behind me and slightly bumped me on the back. I turned around to kind of glare at the person but to no avail because there was no one at the area where I was working. I was getting a little superstitious but continued my work anyway and in the corner of my eye, I could see something was going up and down as though playing hide and seek. 
I stood up from my position and got to the back of the room to check and saw those tails again at the table near the back door. But this time the tails weren't standing upright but rather were laid on the floor and lashing side to side. This time I was certain I wasn't hallucinating and went to have a closer look. When I got close enough the thing glided quickly to a nearby room. I ran after it and when I looked into the room there was nothing weird to be found. I didn't report the incident to anyone because I didn't want anyone thinking I was silly or making up stuff. I'm still working there and hopefully I don't encounter that thing again.